Oke. Okay. Halo, okay. 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 uh, good morning everyone. Welcome to our Saturday morning discussion. The global status of Papua health and natural resources. Sorry. Echoing still. Uh, it's not that clear. Yeah. Echo, echo. I think one of your uh, uh, sound to be turn, turn it off. I think you have like a three line there, right? The other air air by channel. I think you need to um, mute it. Mbak Evi yang satu kan ada RB-nya ada dua, itu yang RB-nya ada dua. Ya, oke, okay. right, oke. Okay. Because Mbak Evi seems like uh, to have some sort of technical problem, and then I try to uh, help again. Uh, good morning, a very good morning, a very good afternoon uh, in Australia for uh, uh, guest speakers uh, and all the uh, participants for the uh, for today's uh, discussion. Um, today's discussion will uh, will be. Uh, on the um, the topic is on the uh, current development status of Papua. We will be looking specifically at the uh, development of digital infrastructure uh, and uh, natural resources. And uh, for today's discussion, we already have uh, um, three distinguished speakers from Australia and uh, one speaker from Indonesia. Uh, from And uh, let me just uh, briefly introduce uh, our speakers for today. Uh, the first one is uh, is Professor uh, Jeffrey Hope. So, Professor Jeffrey Hope, uh, a very good afternoon uh, in Can uh, in Canberra, and uh, 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 welcome to this uh, forum as well. And uh, again, thank you very much for your time. Uh, uh, He has actually, you know, an extensive experience in Indonesia. He is an ecologist uh, who studies uh, pollen and uh, charcoal reports from performing uh, webs. He helped to understand human and climatic influence on uh, the system uh, through uh, a long time scales. Um, he has uh, studied high mountain response to climate change and human settlement in New Guinea uh, since 1969. So very long time ago, and uh, that also included stays uh, uh, in Papua Mountains, uh, in Pamena, in uh, Jaya Wijaya, uh, and Trikora. Uh, also has book at human impact over time in the uh, highlands in Pamena. Pamena is uh, one of the area in the uh, uh, island Papua. Uh, And of course, uh, in some of the uh, lowland studies in Aru Islands uh, and not uh, North Nabire, yeah, Nabire dan Kepulauan Aru, um, he contributed to a very substantial section on uh, paleo uh, ecology. So uh, please, <laughs> Professor Hope, correct me uh, 
uh, my pronunciation because this is something very new for me. Uh, and in uh, 2000, he wrote a book uh, on the ecology of Papua. Uh, and uh, he has an interest in peatlands across uh, the island. He also has surveyed large lowland, uh, uh, lowland peatlands in uh, in Kalimantan Timur. Uh, also, so uh, uh, quite uh, you know uh, extensive. Yes, and he is interested in differences between these and uh, large peatland in New Guinea. Uh, He last visited Papua in 2004, but is still mampir ke Apotik 2004, and uh, currently uh, he's still working on uh, core materials uh, 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 there. Uh, Professor Hope has uh, author no more than uh, 200 uh, publications, books, and uh, articles, and uh, uh, among those publication, uh, some of uh, those or many of those deal with uh, with Papua. including the uh, environmental change in in the Baliam Valley Lemba Baliam uh, along vegetation history from uh, lowland Irian Jaya or Papua Indonesia uh, also a book on uh, biomass burning in Indonesia and Papua New Guinea natural and uh, human induced fire events in uh, fossil record and environmental change in the Aru uh, Island, and also the last one is the soils of Papua, as I may, I've mentioned before. So Professor uh, Hope today uh, will be sharing his experience, some of his thoughts on the balance uh, uh, of natural resources development and conservation in, in Papua. Uh, the second speaker is uh, Professor Richard Chamfa. Pak Gibi, we cannot hear you, Pak Gibi. Oh, thank you. You've muted yourself, Gabriel. Yeah. Pak Gibi, it's mute at the moment. Right. I, I, I'm not, you know, uh, something is just uh, uh, wrong going on. So again, uh, uh, the second speaker is Professor, Professor Richard uh, Changval. Uh, he is currently a principal honorary fellow at the uh, Asia Institute at the University of Melbourne. Uh, Professor Richard has his PhD from the University of Sydney and uh, a Master of Art at the uh, School of Oriental and African Studies, uh, London. Uh, as, he, uh, as we know him, his research has focused on political and social change in Eastern Indonesia. Uh, of course, Papua is, uh, is one of those and then also in Maluku. Uh, some of his uh, notable publication include uh, Indonesia ending uh, repre- repression in Irian Jaya. Uh, the other one would be uh, the uh, land of Papua and the Indonesian state uh, together with two policy papers from the uh, East-West Center of Washington uh, titled The Papua Conflict, Jakarta's Perception and Policies. Uh, and the other one is Constructing Papuan nationalism, history, ethnicity, and adaptation. Uh, the most recent recent uh, chapters and articles include Papua as a multi multicultural issue for Indonesia and Australia, um, and Papua under the Jokowi presidency, uh, which is uh, very current as well. So. Uh, also, currently, pa, uh, Richard has been traveling. Uh, uh, all around Indonesia and uh, give some you know lectures uh, in Universitas Indonesia, Universitas Gajah Mada, Universitas Bra- Brawijaya and also Universitas uh, Cendrawasi and uh, given his uh, extensive experience in social and political change so Parichat uh, we expect Parichat would share some of the uh, thoughts on the you know uh, uh, the uh, social and political change and also uh, a little bit of uh, conflict in uh, And um, then we have uh, Pa Freddy Numberi. Uh, pa Freddy, thank you very much for uh, being with us. Uh, uh, we know that you've been very busy currently, and even you uh, cancel your uh, health appointment this morning uh, to be with us. As we uh, know that uh, 
Pa Freddy is the uh, retired uh, admiral uh, in Indonesian Navy, and also uh, well we know him uh, more as a politician. Uh, he was part of the Second United Indonesian uh, Cabinet and served as the uh, Ministry Minister of Transportation uh, between October 22, 19, uh, 2009 to October uh, 2011. And also uh, under the uh, presidency of uh, Susilo Bambang Yudhoyono, uh, Pak Freddy uh, was chosen as the ambassador of Indonesia to Italy, to Albania, and uh, Malta. And uh, then uh, uh, again uh, was born as the minister minister of uh, maritime affairs and fisheries from 2004 to 2009. But of course, uh, apart from that. Uh, Pa uh, Freddy was the uh, governor of Papua from 1998 to 2000. So, uh, Pa Freddy is today uh, with us to share again his experience. Uh, you know, uh, uh, sitting in many positions, but uh, he preferred to share with us on the uh, um, the uh, 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 let me check, uh, let me check. Okay, uh, Papua in general, in the eyes of international community. And then the other issues, which is you know depend on uh, how we can uh, uh, use his uh, his experience. Uh, and uh, last but not least, we have uh, uh, let me call Ibu Jenny, <laughs> Ibu Jenny uh, Munro. I was uh, surprised myself because uh, apparently Bu, Bu Jenny can speak uh, Bahasa. Uh, Bu Jenny has also uh, conducted uh, uh, an extensive research in Papua, and uh, he is uh, known as the uh, 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 political uh, anthropologist, uh, which specialize in the issue of uh, of health, he has been conducting many research uh, on health issues, looking at the uh, uh, from the perspective of uh, of uh, uh, indigenous people, even also uh, as I uh, can see in her pub- publication, uh, the, the role of the uh, uh, customary institution. So. Uh, Uh, Professor Jenny will uh, will be sharing with us on uh, uh, the issues of uh, of health, which is also another important issues um, uh, in in Papua. So uh, that would be uh, pretty much our speakers today. Because uh, uh, beyond that, all of the participants uh, are speakers, are uh, resource person. So uh, we also have uh, Ambassador Imron Kotan. Uh, Uh, which happened to join with, with us today, and we also have some of the uh, leading figures from from many minist- uh, ministries in Indonesia, and also uh, 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 one uh, another important uh, resource for today is uh, Miss uh, Sarah Hewitt, uh, as introduced by Jenny before. So thank you, everyone, uh, basically for being uh, here today with us, and then uh, uh, to start with, uh, I would like to invite. Professor Richard uh, Chauvel, uh, Richard, you uh, you are the uh, you know the first speakers, and you have uh, around 25 minutes, Pa, uh, uh, to share your experience, and then uh, the time is all yours. Please, Pa Richard. Now, can you hear me? Okay, and would you like yes. me to share my presentation, or can you put it up? Uh, you may do it uh, uh, as well. Uh, Parichat? Yeah, okay. Oh, just... I think you have to enable me to do it. Okay. Uh, but Effie, can someone help uh, Parichat to uh, do that? Okay, Parichat, done. I've uh, enabled you to share the... Uh, share the screen. Okay. Good. I hope I hope that is um, uh, that that is visible. So I'd like to start off by thanking uh, Patedi Montoro and Yaya San Mandela Wangi for the invitation and the opportunity to um, participate in in this um, uh, important important discussion. I think it's a it's a it's a great privilege for me as a as an international observer of of Indonesia and. And perhaps particularly Papua to participate in in such a discussion, um, and you can all appreciate that uh, over the last several months that um, it has been a matter of observing Indonesia and Papua from a considerable uh, uh, distance during the uh, uh, during the pandemic. 
you know, the last time I was in Indonesia uh, was at um, <clears throat> Pak Gabriel's University in Yogyakarta, uh, yes. which I enjoyed very much. Um, <clears throat> What I'd like to do today is to, um, and it's a, it's a great honor to be speaking at the on the same panel as pa, pa Freddy Numberi, uh, and the, I'm sure Pa Freddy, as, as along with along with my Australian colleagues, will will bring us um, many many insights on the current issues uh, and recent developments in um, uh, in Papua. So I, <clears throat> I'd like to to split my my comments into. In, into three brief uh, sessions. The, fir the first, uh, the, the, fir the first being, seemed to me that, uh, that we are now looking. We are now in a position to to reflect back on two decades of of, of, of important developments um, uh, in uh, in, <coughs> in in Papua. Uh, and I think that the important developments that have really taken place since the uh, uh, fall, fall of the New Order government and the resignation of President Zahato in um, May 1990, uh, 1998. And I think that it's a, the I think that that period of time in the years immediately after uh, Zahato's re resignation uh, <clears throat> brought about or we we, we, we witnessed the um, uh, the Revival and transformation uh, of the of the independence movement. You remember the the meeting of of a, of a hundred uh, Papuan leaders with President Habibi in uh, in February 1999, when the Papuan leaders demanded uh, uh, that independent their independence be be recognised. That was followed the following year with the uh, Congress Papua Papuan People's um, Congress of mid uh, 2000. And then the important um, special autonomy law was eventually um, <clears throat> signed into law in 2001. And I think the, the, the current debate in Papua and amongst policymakers in, in Jakarta about the, the extension uh, of the financial provisions of the special autonomy law have morphed into a much more general discussion of um, Indonesian governance in Papua. Um, and I think it, allow, it, it allows us to, to reflect back on the last, the last two decades uh, and see how, and think about how uh, Papua has changed uh, with, within the context, within a national context, which uh, Indonesia has experienced and still is going through a process of democratic uh, transition. Uh, it has successfully held five national elections and hundreds of local elections. At the same time, Indonesia has become a, uh, a member of the, the G20. So we're, we're talking about a, a period of, uh, of, of very, very considerable change, both within Indonesia as a whole and particularly uh, uh, in, uh, in, in Papua. So if I'd like to <coughs> Just dwell very briefly on the special autonomy law. Use the Indonesian Singkatan of of, of OTSUS. It's um, it's a bit easier. <coughs> OTSUS has become the <coughs> the broad framework for Indonesian policy uh, in Papua uh, for the period since uh, two two thousand and one. Very brief. Supplemented by um, policies and programs and institutions promoting accelerated economic development, in Papua, particularly under the uh, uh, President Yuriano uh, and, and uh, when we think about <clears throat> contemporary developments in in Papua, I think it's important to reflect back on how. The special autonomy, the, the special autonomy law came to be uh, to be formulated, and I think it's most important, you know, in the context of the current debate, uh, to um, to remember that the, the the law that was passed in two thousand and one was a function of negotiations between a special committee of the national parliament 
uh, and um, um, <clears throat> a, a, a special team appointed by the then governor of the province of, um, uh, of Papua. So it, it was a, <clears throat> a negotiation and the formulation of the law in which Papuans uh, played uh, uh, an, an important part, uh, important part in, and the outcome of uh, of those negotiations was a was a, <clears throat> a law that provided somewhat um, <clears throat> wider autonomy, more generous allocation of revenue uh, <clears throat> to the provincial government than what was the case with the the general nationwide regional autonomy laws of, of uh, 1999. Uh, <clears throat> I think it's important to, to reflect that the special autonomy law reflected many of the values that were discussed during that so-called Papuan spring of a couple of years after uh, President Zahato's resignation as, as they were um, <clears throat> Uh, articulated at the 2000 Congress, um, uh, Congress Papua, and the law recognised the interests and identities of Indigenous Papua, Orang Asli, Asli Papua, Sabagi Bagi, and uh, Dari, Dari, um, Dari Melanesia, its cultural symbols, and the MRP, the Papuan People's Assembly, was established as a representative of, of uh, Papua. There's also, it was planned and still not implemented, a commission of truth, truth and reconciliation was, um, uh, was established. In, <clears throat> in some respects, as many observers have, um, uh, have, have argued, that the special autonomy law was in a sense, the Indonesian government's response to Papuan demands for independence, delivered directly to President Habibi in the beginning of 1999 and articulated with the Congress, uh, uh, Congress Papua. Uh, <clears throat> many of the law's supporters in, in Jakarta that hope with the uh, implementation of the special autonomy law uh, that the Papuan support for independence uh, would moderate. And I think looking back <clears throat> 20 years later, I think one of the questions that we need to uh, address of whether that hope of policymakers and political leaders in, in Jakarta, the support for independence would, um, uh, <clears throat> would become more moderate, has, it, has, has this indeed, um, uh, indeed happened? And I think it's, it's worth keeping in mind that as, as we observe and try to analyse the current debate about the, <clears throat> the future of the special autonomy law now taking place in, in, in Papua uh, and uh, <clears throat> elsewhere, is, is that <clears throat> the special autonomy law has always been a matter of considerable contention. Uh, it was at the, <clears throat> at the time it was introduced uh, and has been um, ever since. And I think to, <clears throat> to remind us of that. Klikanan, Mbak. More, more. Klikan. Um, to, to, re <clears throat> to remind us of that, I'm, I'm, I'm borrowing a slide from my, um, my old friend, Simon Morin, the former member of the, uh, the DPR uh, and a... <clears throat> The distinguished Papuan. He, pa, pa Morin gave a, gave a seminar in Sydney in, uh, I think it was in 2002, 2003, in which he <clears throat> reflected the aspirations of many Papuan leaders, particularly senior government leaders of the time, in, including the then government, Governor Salosa, uh, the, his successor, Basuebu. Who, who saw who, who saw the special autonomy law as a means of conflict resolution. And you can see in this diagram how that Morin is depicting a, an existing conflict. And he thought with the effective implementation of the special autonomy law, that eventually Papua would become, uh, and if, you know, if the law is implemented successfully, 
Papuan people will get a, a stronger position uh, as part of the Indonesian nation and thereby strengthening uh, national um, in integrity. And I think that, that one of the issues that I think we can we can reflect on is to what extent Pat Morin's hopes for the successful implementation of special autonomy have indeed been realised. And I'd comment that it doesn't seem to me that there is so much elite Papuan support for the continuation of special autonomy as there was at the beginning of this process. And one of the, I think, the things that we can look at is why the, if this isn't, <clears throat> if I'm think, if I'm right in thinking that this is indeed the case, what, why has this in fact happened? And th this is to, to, to just to, to illustrate to a couple of very, very, um, uh, very simple diagrams in, in a sense, a very, a very crude representation of the some of the aspects of the uh, of the debate about the special autonomy law currently going on 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 the left hand side we have the graph of the of the relatively generous budget allocations to papua over the period of the the, the special autonomy law so that this is uh, <clears throat> i think particularly from the perspective of the uh, the central government uh, that it has been very supportive of Papuan, um, Papuan economic development and so on with that relatively generous allocation of, 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 of budget. On the other side of the, the slide is, is, is really depicting something of, of that, that, that section of Papuan uh, political opinion, uh, which is wanting to reject the continuation of the of the uh, the special autonomy law and the, the, the so-called second volume Jilid Kadua. It also makes reference to the the way that the issues and and values of the Papuan lives matter has also impacted on the uh, debate in uh, in in Papua. And as I noted not noted before. What we're, what we're talking about in the, the narrow technical sense uh, is that next year the, the generous financial provisions of the special autonomy law will come to, uh, will come to an end. But I think what we can observe in, in Papua in particular is that the debate about the, the financial provisions has become a much more broadly broadly focused uh, debate and a discussion about how the law has been been implemented whether it has failed or not uh, should it be rejected revised or, um, or continued or should there should there be a, be a referendum and i think it's important to, to think about to think about the um, uh, the, the debate in in the way it has it has been uh, been framed and influenced by the key developments really probably dating from the end of, of um, 2018 with the killing of construction workers in, uh, in Nduga. Um, <clears throat> the, racist cases out, the racist cases in, in the Papuan, uh, Papuan hostels in Surabaya and Malang followed by the widespread demonstrations, anti-racism protests in uh, throughout Papua in August and September of, uh, uh, of last year, and how, how within that context, the uh, Papuan Lives Matter um, uh, has, has, has gained, um, uh, gained, gained traction. And now I'd like to move on to the, briefly to the, to the second bit of my talk, and, and look at some of them, uh, <clears throat> some of the underlying development issues and demographic, economic, structural issues uh, of which government policies and particularly the special autonomy law and the um, policies of accelerating Papua and development. The, the, um, <clears throat> these very crude, broad metrics, which I'm going to talk about for, for a couple of minutes, provide that 
that broader context. And I think as, as the title of my talk suggested, I think what we're looking at in, in, in Papua is a paradox of resource wealth and subsistence, um, uh, and subsistence um, poverty. What I'm going to be, be arguing that we're looking at, in a sense, two dimensions of, of inequality and the differences in, 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 <clears throat> in welfare and economic development between the two Papuan provinces on one side and the rest of Indonesia uh, on the other. But there are, imp there, there are important inequalities within Papua itself. And I think that these feed in, uh, into, the, in, into the challenges of how governments in Papua and in, in Jakarta formulate effective economic development um, economic development policies. So to, 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 to capture them, some, something of, the, the, of that paradox, uh, West Papua and Papua, as measured by um, <clears throat> gross regional product per, per capita, uh, are, among <clears throat> are amongst the wealthiest, are amongst the wealthiest provinces of uh, <clears throat> fifth and sixth wealthiest provinces in Indonesia. If we look at the <clears throat> Human Development Index, the two Papuan provinces sit at the bottom of the table. And it's this contrast which goes both to the heart of the development challenges that governments face uh, and also, I would argue, significantly influence the nature of the con political conflicts which uh, continue in in um, uh, in Papua. So the inequalities within Papua itself can be have have I would argue uh, a distinct ethnic dimension. Uh, so it's the the differences in economic development, welfare, as measured by by human development uh, indexes between um, a predominantly Papuan impoverished mainly in the highland and remote areas in comparison with the relatively wealthy non-Papuan um, urban areas and the areas around the uh, Freeport, um, uh, Free, 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 Freeport mine. I think that the that, that underlying or the, the general background uh, to these settlement economic inequality uh, factors which I'm talking about is that I think, you know, we all have to, to keep in mind the fundamental demographic transformation uh, that has occurred in Papua uh, since the, the early 1960s. In other words, since, the, uh, since, since um, Papua again became part of, um, uh, part of Indonesia. According to the last Dutch census, something like 2.5% of the population under Netherlands administration uh, was people of Indonesian background from outside, uh, outside Papua. According to the 2010 census, uh, this figure uh, had uh, in, whoops, uh, increased uh, in, in increase greatly to about um, 30, 36, I think, percent of the um, uh, of the population. So by any by by any by any terms, the, by any global comparisons, that is a massive uh, a, a massive demographic um, uh, tran transformation. If we look at Cities like like um, uh, Jayapura uh, and Sarong, uh, the portion of the the uh, non Papuan portion of the population is now well over uh, 60 uh, 60 percent. So if you if you try and think about these in, in the sense of distinct set, settlement settlement patterns, and I suppose what I've labelled here is the uh, the ethnic demography of um, uh, of Papua, 
but in uh, in Papua province, over 80% of the, the non-Papuan pop uh, population are concentrated in, in Jayapura, Marake, Maribe, Gerom, and around the, uh, the, the, the Freeport mine. Um, well, whereas Papuans make up the majority of over 90% of the four districts of the central central highlands in, in, in Papua. Um, <clears throat> and you very, find a very sim, you know, comparable settlement demographic pattern in uh, the province of West Papua uh, as, as, uh, uh, as well. And when, when you... When, 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 you, when you overlay these two different, what I argue, predominantly ethnic settlement, settlement patterns in Papua, and then overlay that with the uh, human development index index figures, you find you see that um, Jayapura and Zara have HDI figures which are by no means out of place. With many other urban areas in the um, uh, in in the archipelago, whereas in the predominantly Papuan highlands, uh, the HDI figures are well below, significantly below the the, the, the national figure, uh, and it's, it's perhaps notable uh, that the district of Nenduga, where we saw that those killings of construction workers at the end of 2018 has the lowest of not even even, even 30. So I think that the, these, what we're looking at, I think, uh, is, 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 is really um, um, a um, an economic structure, um, <clears throat> which is in a sense resonates with Furnival's depiction of Colonial society in the 1920s and, uh, and, and, and 30s, a society of uh, comprising of two or more elements or social orders living side by side, but not mingling. So that this is the uh, to, to uh, we're, we're, we're we're looking at a uh, an economy where urban economies are dominated by the. Um, the non-Papuan immigrants from elsewhere in Indonesia, um, and to to a degree, the Papuans are, are isolated with, uh, with within that. As, um, <clears throat> one on the left-hand side is, is a, 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 in in Hamadi, just outside central Jayapura, uh, one of many um, Papuan artifacts all run by non-Papuans. And likewise, you get this contrast in the, an old photo in the central part of Jaipur of the first um, KFC and, and supermarket in contrast to Papuan women selling uh, small quantities of vegetables uh, and fruit in, in, the, uh, in the evening. So it gets, the, gets that, back to that idea of, of Furnival's plural uh, plural society, and what I would argue, and I'll just briefly touch on, that this demographic transformation, if we read the, liter the political literature put, put out by many, uh, many Papuans, uh, it has been, and certainly as I have argued and colleagues from Lipi have argued, that that demographic transformation is one of the factors fueling uh, Papuan nationalism. And on the other side of the coin, just very, very briefly, is the the, the the very the very significant wealth of Freeport. So the the other side of the uh, of the coin of of, um, uh, of Papuan poverty and, and marginalisation uh, is the Freeport mine. And as we we all know, one of the largest gold and copper mines in the in the world, um, and constituting a very significant part of the um, province of Papua's GDP and, and, and also of Indonesia. I think the, where, where the politics of this work is, uh, is, is how Freeport has, has become to symbolise for Papuan political activists and, and nationalists that the mine has come to symbolise the exploitation of Papuan resources uh, for, the, uh, for, for the benefits of the, 
um, benefits of others and, 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 and not and not Papua's. I think it's it's worth noting that the uh, human rights movement in Papua really started around uh, alleged abuses um, uh, that that, uh, that occurred uh, around the Freeport mine and the first notable um, report on human rights human rights abuses was about uh, Freeport and the surrounding area, published in 1995. Um, <clears throat> I would just like to to finish my, uh, my, my, my presentation with a very brief comment, because I know this is an area that Pat Gabriel has, has some interest in. But I think much of them, what motivated me to, to, to finish on the very significant changes in the administrative structures in, in Papua, uh, is, um, is that you know quite se nearly quite separate from the tendency and the debate, at least in Papuan circles, about uh, about the success, success or otherwise, uh, of the special autonomy law, is for us to remember uh, that success or otherwise, there have been enormous changes in the politics, society, and administration uh, of Papua. Not, not, not occurring independently of the special autonomy law, uh, but certainly under the umbrella, but changes that have brought about really significant change, and I would argue with implications uh, for the capacity of government to provide services uh, and promote economic development. Um, and I think the the process of Pamekaran, of the creation of, of, of new provinces and, and new um, um, and new district governments, is a national phenomenon. I think the the number of Kubupaten Kota uh, has more or less doubled uh, since the beginning of the Reformasi uh, the the Reformasi period. In the case of Papua, uh, there's been an increase of some fourfold. So what was originally 12 districts uh, in, now, in the region now covering uh, the, two, the two provinces has grown to almost 40. Um, <clears throat> and we've seen in beginning beginning of 2003, the division, uh, the division of Papua into, into two provinces of Papua and Papua, uh, pa Papua Barra. And the, the sorts of changes that this has facilitated, I think we see in the, the dispersal and, and nearly the emergence of, of local political elites and their incorporation uh, within the, the, the national government administrative uh, system. I think there's been a process of both the state co-opting local elites and local elites also co-opting and changing the, the state, particularly at those local levels of um, government. The questions that I want to, 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 to leave you with uh, is, you know, have these many new district governments brought about the provision of better health uh, and education services or not? You know, have there been more of have these new local governments been <clears throat> been more effective in implementing government development uh, government development programs that we know both under President Yuriono and President uh, Jokowi, the the objective is accelerating uh, economic development in the Papuan provinces. Has this new fragmented structure of administration facilitated that process or not. So what I'm suggesting is that we need a, a um, I think a more, uh, a more thorough evaluation of those very uh, sig significant, uh, significant changes in the structure of administration. And not least uh, because there is currently a, a proposal for a further division of the creation of two or three more provinces in um, uh, in, in Papua. And I think the, the, the same questions need to be asked of that, that process. And I think with the 
the Mekaran process with the creation of uh, all those new district governments, uh, there, to the best of my knowledge, was never uh, was 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 never any grand design. What we're talking about is a largely ad hoc process uh, of creation of these new administrative areas, uh, rather than uh, any rather than as a result of Bapanas or other or Dalam Nagri saying, you know, this is the appropriate structure for uh, uh, the administrative structures in 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 Papua. Uh, <clears throat> So I think just to, to very quickly finish up, I think what we've what we can reflect on over the the, the last um, the, the the last twenty years is that many of the issues of conflict within Papua and between the Papuan provinces and the uh, <clears throat> and and the national uh, the national government continue and are still. Um, uh, are, are still with us. I think we need to reflect on to the extent that the special autonomy law and the development of Bangunan processes, which has gone uh, gone with it, together with the uh, the role of the security forces in Papua, whether any of those uh, any of those strategies uh, have. Uh, have been effective in moderating Papuan um, support for independence. So, thank you very much for your for your, for your patience and attention. Thank you very much, Pak Richard. Uh, we can get uh, some uh, very important point from Pak Richard's uh, uh, presentation, looking at the process of special autonomy, which uh, is still going on up to now. A very issue. Uh, Pak Richard also emphasized one of the uh, very important point on the paradox of uh, resource wealth when, uh, where the issue of uh, inequality, not only in geographical terms, but also in demographic uh, terms, has been uh, a very you know, uh, daunting uh, challenge in managing uh, Papua development. Also the issue of, uh, of pemekaran, um, and uh, that really reflects uh, Pak Richard's uh, uh, extensive research on uh, on Papua. And then we can come back to Pak Richard later on in a uh, 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 question on uh, or answer uh, uh, and answer session. So uh, let's move now to the second speaker. And uh, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Jenny Munro first, uh, speaking about the issue of uh, health in Papua. So. Uh, uh, Professor Jenny, the time is yours for around 20 minutes, 25 minutes. All right, thank you. Um, I'm still looking at Richard's screen. I was just wondering <laughs> if it <laughs> <distract. laughs> would distract me, Richard. I will end up talking about something else entirely. Um, that's all right. It'll. I can just maybe change the view. I'm, sure. I'm going to. That's all right. Um, all right. So, thank you, everyone. First, I just wanted to acknowledge the traditional owners of the country on which I am meeting you from, um, Yagra and Turbal peoples here in Brisbane in Australia. Pay my respects to elders past, present, and emerging. And also acknowledge all of the indigenous peoples around Indonesia, especially in Tanah Papua. Uh, thank you to the organizers. Thank you to uh, Eddie and... Uh, Dr. Gabri Gabriel for inviting me and uh, also hello to my fellow panelists today. Um, I sort of heard about this webinar a week or so ago and I have not really had time to put together a PowerPoint, um, but I thought that what I would do is just talk a little bit about my work, um, maybe pick up on some of the things that Richard has already raised for us and um, you know look forward to some questions uh, later on. Um, so my work will focus on health or my, sorry, my discussion today will focus on health. Um, I think we can say that, uh, health has been increasingly of attention for Papuans, um, that there is increasing discussion of kind of multiple overlapping health crises 
that threatened the existence of Papuans. So some of these discussions are not new. Um, for example, HIV uh, at epidemic levels, this is something that uh, Papuans have been talking about for quite some time now, probably 15 years or so, which I will touch on a little bit more in a second. Um, but also HIV co-infectious with tuberculosis often. Um, and we have kind of the um, chronic diseases that are on the rise, so non-communicable diseases, diabetes, hypertension in Papua. Um, and also there's a, I guess you could say, um, an epidemic of violence that affects people, different kinds of violence affecting people in different kinds of ways. These are some of the different um, health crises that Papuans have been drawing attention to of late. Um, to the point that the, um, the Papua Health Department uh, director, I guess, Pa Giai, you know, has written a book about um, how he sees his work as uh, in the health department as kind of preventing the extinction of Papuans. And um, sorry, I'm just going to. Uh, preventing the extinction of Papuans. So this is obviously become um, multiple, you know, dimensions of a health crisis in Papua at the moment. Um, and it would be interesting to think about whether those crises have increased or decreased over the past 20 years of special autonomy. I wanted to just say a little bit about myself first and where I'm coming from with this topic. I did my PhD in anthropology at the Australian National University. I graduated from there in 2010. Um, and I focus my PhD research on the experiences of young Papuans going to university in North Sulawesi. Uh, so I had a LIPI permit at that time to go to travel to Manado, and I lived, as an anthropologist tends to do, I lived in the community with Papuan students, um, particularly those from the Central Highlands areas, for over a year in North Sulawesi. Um, I went there to try to understand what it was like for young Papuans, the first generation to be educated in the Indonesian system, to go and experience other parts of Indonesia. So they had all left, um, the ones I got to know best had left their highlands homes and villages, sometimes for the first time ever leaving a place like Wamena in the highlands, and traveled usually by boat four days over to Bitung um, for the, you know, the stop for Manado. Um, and some, you know, many lived there, obviously, for several years during their university studies. And then almost all of them returned back to Papua, most many back to Wamena, otherwise to Jayapura. Um, so I was interested in the dreams that they had for their schooling, um, having grown up in the Indonesian system, which strongly emphasizes the kind of possibilities of education and the transformative potential. Um, and I wondered what the reality was like for them as they studied at university and also what it, what their relationships were like with the local communities that surrounded them in North Sulawesi. So Manadonese people, Minahasan people in those areas. They were bonded together in many ways by Christianity as Manado is a predominantly Christian city and the Papuans that I got to know were predominantly Christian as well. Um, but I was interested in those experiences and I discovered uh, along the way um, many dimensions of what it was like for them to be a young person, to be a student. This might include um, relationships with each other, perhaps even pregnancies and having children. Um, it included their struggles to earn money and to also kind of subside, subsist in those places where they were far from home. Um, and the, but the kind of bigger finding that I took from that earlier work was the extent to which um, the ethnic tensions, the kind of ethno-racial formations between local people and Papuans were very strong. And um, the racism that Papuans experienced in those contexts prevented them in many ways from having a um, an experience of feeling belonging and uh, new relationships and connections in, in North Sulawesi. I suspect that some of these dynamics, as we've seen in the news um, over the years and increasingly last year, are common throughout Indonesia for Papuan young people who are, who are living outside of Papua and, and also in Papua. So in this context, I was interested uh, uh, in how it was that um, these, many of which are historical racial ideas that date to the Dutch period and before, how are they still kind of making their way into people's everyday lives, going to school, whether that's healthcare, going to a clinic, um, and so forth. 
So that work led me to want to know more about those everyday kinds of racism. Um, at the same time, I became increasingly aware through my work with the young adults that HIV was becoming a huge problem in Papua. Um, and so I um, began to want to kind of understand more about the HIV epidemic that was unfolding there, especially as young people were obviously um, victims of this epidemic quite early on. And you can imagine what it was like for their families who had, um, you know, put all of their hopes and dreams into young adults who they had, you know, sent to study abroad in places like Manado or Dokja. Um, often, especially in the Highlands context, using, you know, growing vegetables, growing gardens for sale and raising pigs for sale so that they could also support their, their young people while they were abroad, um, only to have them perhaps succumb to this HIV that began to um, circulate uh, quite strongly, especially in the kind of mid to late 2000s. So I got more interested in health. Um, but I was still hanging on to these questions about um, belonging, about Papuan experiences as part of Indonesia, and about everyday life, and also different kinds of violence. So we often hear about um, overt, dramatic, physical violence in Papua and human rights abuses, but I also wanted to know about those less obvious kinds of violence that make people feel small, that make people feel um, embarrassed, or that make Papuans feel perhaps ashamed. Um, what I found was that there's actually always a mix of kind of um, some aspects that might be um, shameful, like there is some stigma, but there's also a lot of pride, and especially around cultural um, heritage and cultural traditions in Papua. This is something that I found again in work on HIV specifically. I just wanted to also explain, because there are so many questions about how it is that a foreigner can do research in Papua, um, that a bulk, the bulk of my HIV work has been done when I was working with different NGOs in Papua, um, as an advisor and as a collaborator on their programming for HIV. Um, and I was invited to do so by NGOs in Papua. And the advice that I received at the time from the Indonesian embassy um, in Canada was that I should be using a sociocultural visa and that this kind of work did not require a research permit. So I just wanted to make sure that that's really clear. Um, let me just turn now to talk a little bit about the HIV work. So I'm thinking, I'm drawing here on a paper that I've recently published in the Journal of the Royal Anthropological Institute. Um, if you don't have access to that, you can um, email me and I will send you a copy or I think from my academia page, I have preprint uploaded up there for the full paper. Um, I wanna start this by talking about a man called Yoram Yogobi. So Yoram um, was a Dani man from the, or a Bali man from the, from Wamena. Um, I met him first at a 2009 HIV conference in Bali. So there was a big international HIV conference. Um, and since Papua ha was recognized as having quite a high rate of HIV, the government went out of its way to send a lot of participants from Papua to the international conference being held in Bali. And Yoram was one of those people. Um, so we met several times and talked about um, the situation of HIV. Um, and one of the things that was already immediately apparent to me at the conference was that even though it, was, it has become clear that Indigenous Papuans are the ones who are most affected by HIV, the prevalence rates are much higher. Um, there were maybe two speakers, two presentations at the international conference out of 500 presentations that were actually by Indigenous Papuans. Um, and I thought this was, you know, considering the situation in Papua, I wondered then how is this possible that Papuans are going to lead the way and manage this health crisis in Papua if, you know, even in this kind of international context, they barely have opportunities to speak and to discuss their, you know, their experience as and what they need you know, to get the information they might need to work on HIV problems back in Papua. Um, so Yoram talked to me a lot more in later years about um, the real prevalence that he felt uh, HIV was at within Papua. So he didn't know necessarily the statistics because we didn't have um, disaggregated statistics until probably 2013. Um, 
But he talked about empty huts around Wamena. So, you know, the Honai, the round huts, sort of iconic for the Papuan Highlands. Um, and he talked about the fact that there were empty huts. There were simply too many funerals going on. There were just, um, there were, it was clear to him and others that HIV was taking a toll far greater than what the statistical um, evidence was showing. So he talked about the need to save his people. And this also resonates, of course, with what uh, Gia has been saying about saving Papuans. Um, he emphasized the need to get the real data about HIV. Um, and I bring this up partly because one of the issues, as we saw, as, as Pat Richard pointed out, is that the data about um, conditions in Papua is often not disaggregated by ethnicity. So the indigenous status of Papuans is often not captured. So we often don't actually know. Um, we can only estimate based on the fact that more Papuans live in rural areas there and rural areas have say lower rates of literacy. So we're only guessing. However, the census has collected um, ethnic background data since 2010. So it's possible to actually get a much clearer picture about um, you know, what exactly the different literacy or disease prevalence or income prevalence um, income um, amounts are across uh, Papua and to see just how disadvantaged indigenous Papuans are um, or else, who, what other uh, kinds of disadvantage are going on. Are, mi are men or women more disadvantaged and so forth? Um, and also to break down even the, you know, we often talk about the, the non-Papuan um, migrants in Papua as though they're, you know, generally doing well, economically prosperous, but I think there's also poverty there as well, right? There's also poverty in, in migrant populations in Papua. So breaking down some of this data would be really useful. Um, but at the same time, that's just statistical data. So as an anthropologist, I also want to know about people's lived experiences. And I want to know more qualitatively. I want to understand how it is that, you know, the education system is, you know, not producing young people who are literate or how it is that healthcare is not um, improving people's health. I want to also understand what does health actually mean to people? Um, and to see health as more than just health services, but to see health as, um, you know, affected by livelihoods, by environment, by culture, by politics, by violence. Um, and so these are some of the ways that I conceptualize um, health. And this has come about through talking to Papuans about the HIV problem. So one of the, a couple of the things I want to draw attention to that Durham and his NGO and other NGOs have been doing in Papua that I think are really positive and interesting um, are that they are, um, so first of all, they don't chase targets, as we would say. They don't, um, they try not to operate just according to an external kind of procedure of um you know, reporting of uh, kind of efficiency metrics where for every HIV activity, for example, they need to try to distribute 100 condoms or, you know, take 50 people to testing. Um, they try to avoid these kind of restrictive targets and instead focus on the sociocultural um, kind of assets and capabilities that are there. Um, so, for example, the program that Yoram was um, operating in 2013 was called a traditional volunteers program. Um, they emphasize, so this involved local indigenous people as volunteers on an honor, um, pay, pay sort of honorarium. Um, they emphasize using their local languages with people. They emphasize talking to people about HIV and raising awareness about testing and, and other health issues in everyday settings, in the context of their everyday relationships. Um, they were able to do this kind of independently without trying to follow a particular script or set of boxes they needed to check, um, and often quietly. So if we remember that HIV stigma is a massive problem, it can be really useful if healthcare workers are understand those dynamics and then are able to um, help people access care in ways that do not expose their HIV status to everyone in the community. So to keep things private in that sense. Um, this, this cultural approach that they took was really important because Papua, of course, is a context where culture has typically been stigmatized. It has typically been seen as a barrier. People have been constantly accused of being backward. So the fact that the NGOs are saying, actually, 
culture is not a barrier. Culture can actually um, assist us in developing appropriate responses to all of our health problems. I think that's a massive um, step forward and one that should be continued and sustained. Um, you know, that includes things like they had a, uh, a practice of temani, right, where the, the local volunteers would just simply accompany people needing health care to the health care centers. Um, this was something simple, but it, it was very um, useful, and it was not something that an external kind of uh, agency needed to advise people to do. Um, so I guess I, I'm trying to say here that the social contexts of health of access to health are so, so important. Um, health is not just the lack of disease. It's not just a healthcare problem. And medicine and the technical capabilities that are increasing is not enough. So no matter how good the hospitals become or how good the, you know, how many specialists there are in Papua, there are these longer standing issues to overcome to do with the fact that Papuan cultures have been stigmatized the fact that um, racism has entered into the healthcare encounters, the fact there's a history of lack of trust of the government, um, partly because of the violence that continues. Um, so these are just to say that this, this approach that I've seen in Papua um, can use kind of, can help us think more about how to, um, I guess, ask questions about health, education, and other aspects of development to think about the ways that people there are already doing things that are um, moving the situation forward, um, but also the challenges that continue to arise. Um, so I just have one or two more minutes left. So that's my HIV works um, sort of in a nutshell. Um, I also have done some work related to antenatal care and people's experience giving birth in hospitals, um, just around the question of the maternal mortality rate. Um, this also is an area where, um, you know, the increasing surgical and technical abilities to monitor pregnant women's health or to provide them with C-sections is useful in some circumstances, but it is not enough to um, actually ensure that Papuans feel that um, maternity care is safely provided to them and is taking account of cultural experiences and values. Um, there's a lot of pressure in Papua at the moment for women to have babies in hospitals. Um, many people that I spoke with in, in, and my colleagues um, spoke with in urban areas are not opposed to antenatal care and they're not opposed to hospital births. Um, in fact, many people, of course, want healthy babies, they want healthy families. So they want to do everything they can to make sure that happens. Um, however, the pressure for hospital births is often tra translating into situations where people feel they're getting too many um, unwanted interventions from doctors, that they're not being able to be heard, that doctors are not necessarily um, listening to their, their priorities and experiences. Um, and some women are feeling forced to have unnecessary cesarean sections, which only feeds into people's potential concerns about healthcare um, and can lead to further avoidance of it. So I guess in thinking back to um, Pat Richard's questions, I mean, there's many questions I'm sure we will pick up on there, but in terms of education and health and the politics of that, um, I think that this, this work shows that it's those social and cultural aspects that we continue to need to consider, the kind of lived experiences, not just the statistics, but um, the why things are not working and how things actually are through field research in these places to understand what um, decentralization even looks like on the ground in people's everyday lives. Um, okay, I'll end my talk there and just happy for you to uh, answer, ask questions when we get to that. And also I'll put my email in the chat if there's anything you wanna ask me about um, or follow up to get that um, publication that I was that I was mentioning. Um, thank you. Kembalikan waktunya. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much again, uh, Professor Jenny, for uh, having shared her experience in dealing with, uh, you know, especially uh, HIV issues in Papua, uh, which, you know, uh, currently sometimes is or very, very frequently linked to the uh, uh, potential of uh, Papuan's uh, extinction, uh, a term that I have heard for many times. 
Um, but uh, what is uh, so important from uh, Professor Jenny's point is the importance of uh, putting uh, problem like HIV not only in the health context or medical context, but also in a more cultural or anthropological uh, uh, context. The importance of you know uh, listening to the uh, to the patient. Uh, their personal experience before being treated. And this is very important not, uh, for the uh, health workers and also for the government. Uh, just to give you uh, some idea, uh, Professor Jenny, you already have one question <laughs> you have to think about that. Uh, and this question comes from the uh, from the government officers uh, asking, how then as uh, we as the government uh, do if, uh, you know, uh, uh, we have to follow the uh, uh, you know, a more anthropological or cu cultural approach in dealing with uh, HIV or other uh, health issues. And also before I move to uh, to Pa Freddy, uh, Pa Richard, you also have uh, many questions, uh, you know, uh, how to deal with the uh, issue of, uh, uh, you know, the uh, pemekaran, uh, so that then uh, pemekaran can really function uh, for the uh, pe uh, welfare of the of the people. And also uh, a question on um, on the issue of uh, of security. Um, I can see here. Let me check uh, very quickly. Um, um, how uh, how important is the issue of uh, security? Has uh, uh, something to do with the uh, uh, welfare of the uh, Papuans currently? And that is you know again the question for uh, for. Pa uh, uh, now let me jump to pa Freddy uh, again uh, given his extensive experience serving in so many uh, government posts uh, and also at the same time pa Freddy is also a, a, a true Papuans a native Papuans so uh, pa Freddy uh, will be sharing with us uh, uh, Papua development uh, specifically or Papuan in the uh, international perspective so uh, Pak Freddy, the time is yours around 25 minutes. Silakan, Pak. Saya share ya. Pak Freddy bisa lihat ya, sudah? Uh, yes, uh, sudah bisa. Uh, Pak Freddy bisa unmute dulu. Halo, bisa kedengaran nggak? Yes, ya, ya, bisa Pak. Oke. Okay. Terima kasih okay. Pak. Uh, honorable speakers and uh, honorable participant uh, in this uh, webinar, Dr. Richard Chauvel and uh, Dr. Yanu Munro from the University of Queensland and Dr. Geoffrey, uh, and a special the host of this channel, <laughs> Mrs. Effie Arya Ar 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 I would like to thank Mr. Effie especially for inviting me to this. Uh, let me explain to you about the current development status in Papua. Because uh, most of the, in my experience, most of the people uh, see the experience from the past. Actually, it's now changing. How about the strategy, strategy and policy and the development approach especially based on culture and natural resources. Yeah. If you see the cultural actually in Papua, there are seven areas of cultural with 257 ethnic, ethnic groups or tribal groups. And the natural resources is now changing in, in, a, in a frame of, it must be eco-friendly and sustainable. That is the policy of President Jokowi now, nowadays. Um, in the past, I don't talk, talk, talk. And I'm, 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 I have already experienced uh, starting from President Suharto until the last is President uh, Susilo Bambang Yudhoyono. The approach is totally different under the uh, leadership of Jokowi. The... Uh, Ibu Jenny, eh, Ibu, Ibu N, Eti, kok kembali yang kedua dong? Oh. <laughs> Ini yang ketiga. 
uh, yeah nowadays uh, president jokowi made the approach to papua especially in the, in terms of development must be based on it must be thematic spatial in means of uh, the infrastructure this uh, space uh, area which is uh, which is available to the development itself and it must be integrated in such a way that up to avoiding a, a, a mis a misprocedure from the from the past and it must be holistic in terms and all that must be uh, in terms of sustainable in, in the long term and it has also relation to the uh, sustainable development goals in 2030 i think what president jokowi is caring about now yeah, indonesia now is how did the development in indonesia in terms especially in papua or other provinces must achieve the development goals the sustainable development goals if the, if the approach is still like the old times it will make many chaos in the long run so the president decree uh, number 59 in 2007 about the implementation of the achievement of sustainable development goals must be integrated into the pro development programs and if you see there are 17 and um, 17 targets and 169 uh, achievement that and to, the, to achieve in the longer run and then how you talk about papua itself what is the papua condition right now let me start with that number no three <laughs> the central government a regional government and the papua itself and the private and business sectors have to put special attention on the health, education, and what uh, Jenny has uh, mentioned before about HIV. So health must be a first priority. If not, the issues of genocide, Papuan people are always there, especially the, uh, the, the Papuans. So health must be first priority. And he has, uh, HIV, must put also in uh, in the in the terms of uh, in a high priority to, to to resolve it. If not, there are also always about genocide Papuans. And the second, education itself. If you want to talk about digital infrastructure and everything, it is bullshit when you don't educate the people, the human resources in Papua itself must be increased in terms of education. And that's, we can we can embark then for, our, for the long run. And the third is the local food security. Everybody's thinking about now. The question is, how about 2030? How about 2050? Can the Papuan people survive? If you and give only rice, it will make them miserable. The sago plantation must be grown. The local food must be increased so they can survive in the long term. And that is now come to concern of the uh, President Jokowi. That's why Bapanas, they are changing the policy. They to put it like that. And the local economic development, basic infrastructure, participation of Papuans in all the fit. In the past, there is no participation. That's why everybody's refused the OTSUS. They say, we don't like OTSUS anymore. So participation and overcome the poverty with the sociology, anthropology approach with local character and the sustainable development goes 2030. If you think about 2030, it's a time of next year is 2030 already. It's not a, it's not a long way to go. It's very short. So 
I will take a sample of the highland of Papua. I will come to Mepago area. This Mepago area cultural area consists of uh, nine regencies. Puncak Jaya, Nabirei, Panyai, Dogiai, Puncak, and Puncak Regency Puncak itself, Mamberamo Tengah, Middle Mamberamo, Bayani, Intan, Intan Jaya, Mimika. And the Lapago cultural area consists of seven regencies, Pegunungan Bintan, Jawi Jaya, and so on. Lani Jaya, Yaukuna, Tolikara, Yalimu, and so on. How do we do the development in those areas? How you do, do the approach? Because this is the this, this central island is always shouting about independence, shouting about separation. So, what is the approach actually to to them so they can become welfare? That's why we have to put the approach must be thematics. Holistic, integrative, and special sustainable. If you want to achieve, you cannot put all the way in Java, all in Sulawesi, all in Kalimantan, the way of development to put in Papua. It's very, it's very different. The cultural based approach, anthropological based approach, is very important to achieve a better life for the Papuans. The last, uh, my last uh, explanation about, in the context of international, national, and local context from 1998 to 20, 2024, and, and from now on, uh, international, always the issue of human rights. And the others are business like Freeport in the destruction of environment. The social networks and Papua diaspora with the issue of independent Papua. Diploma, diplomacy of Papua issues in the Pacific region. West Papua issue in the, in the, in the Pacific Island Forum, leaders communicate. In, and in 2000, there is a special special uh, announcement I mean that made, made down, down there. And the, and the last is uh, the international attention and policies toward Papua must be constructive. I, I underline this. The international attention and the policies toward Papua in supporting Indonesia must be constructive rather than inflammatory. That is the way Papuans see it. If you want to support the government, do it like that from the eyes of international. In the national context, what has to be done related to the President uh, Jokowi policy? Dialogue, which is already exempted by uh, President Habibie, as, uh, as Professor uh, uh, Dr. Chaufer mentioned. 100 Papuan people under my leadership as a governor, I bring them to meet President Habibie. And the President Habibie issued the law of 45 related to the what? Uh, uh, Dr. Chaffer mentioned about the separation of the provinces and related to that. And the expansion of uh, expansion of the other provinces in the in the long run. And uh, Gusdur, there is a difference between all the presidents. Under Gusdur, the use of Bintang Kejora is allowed. <laughs> it's, uh, it's amazing. It's amazing. The use of president, all this at the long run, it becomes turbulence of Papua itself. And last, President Megawati issued the law of 21 is about OTSUS, concerning Papua special autonomy. All of that, all of that, there must be national leadership. Always there is a lack of leadership. The regime under Suharto, under Habibi and all the as, as, uh, uh, President Susilo, I think that there are lack of leadership in terms of national, but locally. And the uh, national reform agenda, 
What is the national reform agenda? Must be done by Jokowi. It is already described in the in, the, in terms of development of uh, Bapenas related to Papua especially. And local locally, their demands in various cities in Papua and the issues of injustice in the government. What uh, Dr. Chafol is mentioned is right. We have to go through and establish as the establishment of the right policy on the right issue. Integration history, it's always mentioned about from the Papuans. They say we are not uh, integration by force to Indonesia and so on and so on. So everybody is lack of the background of history. Indonesian history, actually, not only Indonesian people know the history exactly related to resident at Papua colony at the in the year in the in the year one eight thousand eight thousand something eighteen thousand something yeah. and the Papua draft so special spoilers of Rumi coming ahead after everybody refused waiting right now. So their recommendation actually in the longer run engaging with legitimate representative of Papua security in a wide ranging of dialogue regarding various issues, including trade, justice and recon reconciliation, security arrangement and division of province, as, uh, as uh, Dr. Jaffer mentioned. Special, special autonomy must fully, must fully implement it for the, for the for the provinces in a proper way and accountability. Why the people refuse autonomy so far? Um, dear speakers and honorable guests, eh? Eight, there are 80 trillions money of outsus trickled down to Papua and nothing is achieved. That's why all the Papuans refuse this auto autonomy. They say the autonomy is bullshit. We don't achieve anything about that. Only the uh, only the other Papua, not not the the, the ordinary people for Papuan uh, are achieving that. So it means it it means there is something missed in the policy. There is something wrong in the policy, and we have to correct it. And that is the time during uh, 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 President Jokowi, actually. United Nations, United States especially, and others including European countries, Japan, Australia, and Asian member states, must include in a constructive engagement and support Indonesia, actually, in conflict resolution efforts through quiet but firm diplomacy. It must be a quiet and firm diplomacy supporting Indonesia. That is the only way to resolve Papuan problems. If not, it became chaos. Uh, I think uh, it's enough for me. Uh, the condition right now is right, both in Jakarta and Papua, for new efforts to achieve and comprehensive solution in, to the conflict in Papua. Yeah, international actors should reiterate their support for Indonesia territorial integrity, while underscoring the importance of addressing Papua's leg legitimate concerns. Quite pressure should be put on the Indonesian government to fulfill its public com comments to resolve the Papuan conflict. Thank you. I give it back to the moderator. Thank you very much, pa Freddy, for uh, you know again uh, sharing some of uh, and thought. You know, especially looking forward to the uh, betterment of Papua. And some of the uh, keywords mentioned by Pa Freddy is the importance of uh, focusing on human resource development. Um, uh, mm -hmm. And also in terms of policy, uh, participation a lot is, is, is very important. Government is not to uh, make any one or uh, Logical, uh, especially in the context of the 
quickly with uh, with more question later, but one of the question raised one participant to Pa Freddy is Yeah, I'm listening. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then uh, for the uh, uh, better public service and so on. So uh, you may respond to that question. No, I don't. I, I don't. I don't get it. I don't get you. Okay. What is the question actually? <laughs> so now uh, let me jump to. Uh, she will be, uh, he will be speaking on the <laughs> development uh, concept. Hope you have uh, 20 minutes. Time is yours. And you can ask the signal is not really good, so can you write or something because we cannot hear because the signal is Dr. Gabriel, can you write it down for me because the signal is not good. I can hear you, I can't hear you. Okay, I'm sorry for that, Pafredi. Uh can you write down the question so I, I can read it? I, so I will the, the signal is very bad. Okay. I, can, I, I cannot hear you. Hello, Professor Ho. Yes. Uh, oh. Yes. Uh, you may go, Professor. You have 25 minutes. Thank you. I'll put a uh, PowerPoint up. So, um, well, uh, Pak Freddy's uh, covering some very cosmic questions, and um, I'm really just covering a small aspect of uh, Arian's um, development. Uh, and obviously, a theme through the whole uh, symposium has been the balancing of uh, trying to uh, get people well off and a uh, reasonable amount of equality versus, uh, in this case, the uh, preservation of some of the things that makes uh, Papua really uh, a unique spot. And um, um, my interest in, uh, in Papua are related to, I'm, I'm just an ordinary scientist um, who's been to Erin many times. Um, one or two times uh, mirroring Jenny Munro, I've um, actually been there at the invitation of the provincial uh, authorities um, over the uh, probably the wishes of the central government that I not be there. Um, but uh, it was often a, in the past a uh, annoyance to the provincial government that they um, couldn't organise uh, research permits. So some of the work has been a little informal, but uh, always supported by... Uh, people I knew in uh, the University of Chandrawasi or the uh, governor's office. So I've been working on the ecology and climate histories of the high mountains. So my interests go far back in time, uh, 20 or 30,000 years or more, um, which is probably not today's topic at all. Uh, but I also have interests in uh, just how things have changed recently um, over the time of uh, occupation. And I've um, got an interest in climate change effects and I'm also, uh, just by coincidence, uh, forced to take on the job of uh, assessing peatlands across the island. So the topics I wanted to just briefly mention today, and I won't use up too much of our time, is um, climate change and what we might expect in uh, Papua, as distinct from other places. Dilemmas that are probably the most prominent environmental uh, problems for the island at the moment. Uh, some comments on peatlands and wetlands in relation to that. 
And finally, some comments on conservation. Now, uh, unlike our other speakers, I'm not really super up to date in terms of personal experience in um, Papua, either of the Papuan provinces in uh, the last few years. So I apologise for that. I have been, uh, of course, keeping up to date as far as I can on the web. Um, so take my uh, comments as a bit of a old colonial scientist type uh, remarks and uh, and uh, you can make your own interpretations. So climate change. Um, interestingly, Papua has the most clear illustration of climate change and its acceleration in the last uh, 30 years of anywhere in anywhere really uh, in the Asian uh, region. Uh, and that's because, of course, we have a small ice cap over here in the um, uh, Western Snow Mountains, as I've called them there, or Gunung Mayuki, um, which have lost ice. This is the uh, uh, glacier as it was in 2010. I've had the pleasure of spending a few nights camped up there uh, some time ago, 1995, I guess, and I, I sat on this mountain for three months back in the 1970s. Um, obviously, that's Punchuk Chaya, the uh, tallest peak over here. Uh, we think now it probably is over 5,000 metres. There's a, we originally assessed its uh, height in the original expedition I came here for at 4,884 metres, and that's still on the maps, but it's likely there's been some adjustments to the mine survey since then. Well, that glacier is uh, the East Carstens Top Glacier, and uh, it's pretty much disappeared here before it was a great ice stream. Here's how it looked when I was there in um, 1971, um, and that glacier we're just looking at from over this side is this one here. And originally, that is to say within the last um, 100 years or so, it extended right down this valley and this ice mass also. And we can see the change in ice extent, which represents warming. Um, the green line is the area in 1936 when the first Dutch expedition came there. Um, and the red line is where it was in 2000 when I showed you that picture. It's much smaller now. You can look at it on Google Earth and really just the only two patches of ice are left here on the North Wall Fern and the castings. So what that represents is a rise of about one degree, which accords with long-term temperature measurements in um, in Jakarta. There's probably no great suggestion that uh, the mine, for example, which is very close to this site, is having any effect. But um, it's just part of the rapid warming of the tropics. And the net effects on, uh, luckily, these glaciers are so tiny, the kinds of effects people worry about in the Himalaya, where a major source of water comes from glaciers. And there's no such problem here with the huge rainfall and uh, tiny ice mass. Um, so a direct effect of this is not very great. But uh, the warming has been speculated to cause... Um, a rise in um, crop limits around the place. And I, I was very surprised walking from the Wamana to uh, Kuiawagi a few years ago to find a whole agricultural effort going on at about 3,000 metres, which is much higher than I've ever seen people trying to grow potatoes or uh, um, some other crops, moderately frost-free, frost-insensitive. Frost, uh, um, but they were giving it a good go at a place called Ini Uni at about just on 3,000 metres. So crop limits will rise, that sounds good. On the other hand, say, well, disease limits, and uh, in Papua New Guinea at least it's been recorded that uh, malaria uh, has risen considerably. Um, the other effect of climate change that we seem to be noticing in Irian is, this is the um, 1998 fire. Uh, here I'm looking at it in about the year 2001, um, in the mountains just to the west of Wamana. That's an Othophagus forest that's been uh, cooked up in the, and you, many of you will remember the incredible smoke plume and the fires that just went on for month after month in the 1998, and there have been repeats of these. In 2015, there were severe fires in the Star Mountains, which has a normal rainfall of about 12,000 millimetres, um, which I would have bet would never burn, and I had reason to think it didn't burn because I have records going back 12,000 years there with about two fires recorded in it. But no, it burnt then. 
Um, this is a picture of that Star Mountain sites, these uh, very, um, very, very wet areas. And here on the right is a picture taken after a small fire has come through and, uh, and burnt, well, probably quite a large fire. And there must have been quite a change in climate for that. So uh, what this appears at the highlands level, at least, is significant droughts that are probably, and frosts that have not been experienced previously. So planning really has to take account of the increased likelihood of these kinds of events. The rest of the island is really very well buffered compared to other parts even of Indonesia and certainly Australia in that because of the very high rainfall, um, we can afford to lose quite a bit of it without it having a dramatic effect. But that's not true for southern Irian, where southern Papua, where um, we might expect uh, some very extreme dry phases from time to time. So that's just a comment on climate change and something for us to think that it it needs a bit of development. Um, this is the uh, Lake Habima, which I'm sure some of you know well, um, with the uh, new Sorong to Merauke Road, or a little piece of it, wandering along here. Um, it, records from this lake, for example, show that uh, there's been burning going on around this lake over the last 8,000 years. These grassy areas are actually the result of humans interacting with their environment through that time. So fire isn't something that's brand new in the highlands, but it certainly seems to be um, providing some very dramatic examples at the moment. Jeff, can I interrupt you, please? Yeah. yeah. I, I did not see your uh, slide, by the way. Um, do you want me to share your slide from my side? Oh, I did not see yes. Slide. Sorry, I thought everybody was seeing it. Yeah. Thank you, Jeff. Oh, gosh. Well. Wow. That's, that's a shame. You must be wondering what I'm carrying on about. Um, so we'll just pop back to the uh, picture of burnt forest in the 1998 event. And uh, now we'll go on and just talk about forests and oil palms. So the most dramatic event you can, or effect you can see in looking at successive satellite pictures of the two provinces is, of course, uh, the massive, uh, very recent expansion of... Uh, Clearance. This is a total yes, forest. Still, still, I did Sorry? not see your slide yet. Do you want Can me you to share it? your slide? Yes, I don't please. see it yet. Are you can? Yep. Well, tell me if it's not working. Not working yet. Uh, share screen and your slide. Yep. So I can see now, Jeff, thank you for that. Okay, well, I'm very sorry, uh, everybody. I, I thought we had, uh, everybody else was so good at sharing their PowerPoints. I thought mine was gonna be a, a snack. Um, so this is uh, forest clearance through the uh, time from about 2000 till uh, 2018. And of course, as uh, Park Freddie was just saying, the change in um, attitude around about 2018 means there is quite a significant drop in forest clearance in the last few years that the concessions that have been granted of course are um, uh, quite uh, uh, breathtaking I mean the clearance you can see on the uh, satellite photos is is big enough uh, particularly in the, obvious in the um, north of Merauke and Tanamara but uh, also around uh, parts of the um, West Papua as well. Uh, but the concessions that have been granted are just uh, 10 times that kind of area. Now, it's an interesting question, forests and oil palm. There's a strong incentive for the central government to um, retain at least a substantial forest cover in, in Papua for political reasons, and that is that uh, the rest of Indonesia has um, uh, reduced its forest cover considerably, and 37% um, of Indonesia's forests are now in Papua and West Papua. So if they're going to meet their Paris targets and the amount of carbon released when you clear the forest and uh, release it to oil palm is uh, a stupendous amount, um, maintaining forest cover in Papua has got a strong central government uh, motivation. So 
we're hoping that that uh, leads to some kind of um, uh, maintenance of the policy of not letting all the oil palm concession or all the areas that have been granted to oil palm concessions turn into oil palm. The question, of course, um, and I guess the theme of this talk is whether um, I'm the sort of uh, colonial type who thinks everybody else should stay poor so that we, the world can all enjoy untouched forests. And uh, so there is, I understand that balance between development and uh, conservation, but uh, there is quite a case for uh, not clearing too much of Papua. Um, this is the kind of uh, scene you can see at Tanamera. And I was interested to read, again, I get a lot of my information from um, various uh, NGO uh, websites, of course, but one of them said that uh, the largest of the um, clearances, which I think will be um, Digul Agri, uh, they're expecting to make six billion US dollars yeah. from the timber removal, not just the growing of the oil palm. Um, and that represents, if it's true, a, uh, I presume there is some sort of uh, stumpage paid to the state for that. Some of that six billion goes to the, the state and then has to trickle back down to the people who originally occupied the forest. But um, it does suggest one of the motives for um, oil palm is actually the money you make from collecting timber originally. Uh, forestry in uh, Papua, as everybody knows, is uh, far less productive, far less uh, economic, let us say, than forestry was originally in Kalimantan and uh, neighbouring Malaysia because uh, the forests are far more mixed, generally of lower stature, and uh, so the timber resource can't be just uh, uh, harvested and shipped off to Japan as it was from uh, Kalimantan, the Philippines and Malaysia. Um, but then nonetheless, of course, if that picture is uh, to be believed, there's uh, a huge amount of timber being removed through the uh, ports there at the moment. So we really um, need some uh, balance between uh, a, a massive amount of clearing and the general, uh, I understand, West Papua has declared itself a conservation province and is aiming to keep at least 50% of the forest managed to sustainably. Um, that can mean various things to various people, I guess. Um, and they also anticipate providing much better land tenure to the local people. Um, if the decline of forest clearance in the, after 2018 can be maintained, then um, there are still high carbon costs. So, um, <clears throat> this is uh, the really the same graph um, shown. Um, well, sorry, um, shown for West Papua, which obviously has a had a sudden leap up here. This is a case the, the little green graph shown in here. Again, I've got this from um, the previous paper that I get the reference to. Uh, shows that some of the forest clearance is going on on peatland. And this is a particularly, uh, has been a massive problem in uh, particularly Kalimantan where a lot of the oil palm has been put out onto peat and uh, the peat has to be drained to provide a bed for the um, oil palm and the oil palm then um, uh, slowly consumes the peat, if you like to think of it that way, or the peat oxidises. So the carbon cost is... Uh, immense for doing this. So although, um, as I understand it, uh, uh, Papua and Papua, West Papua have um, something like 28% uh, of wetlands across their surface, it would be, uh, we're very anxious that we don't repeat the mistake in Kalimantan and start clearing peatlands for oil palm. Um, as you can see here, it hasn't been very pronounced yet, but we only have to clear a, a small proportion of the forest on peatland to have a carbon yield that exceeds all the other carbon loss from um, clearing forest. So finally, moving on to the topic of peat, West 
Papua is uh, probably the second most extensive peat province, peat uh, you know, province in uh, or provinces in uh, Indonesia, and of course uh, the between Sumatra and Kalimantan, um, a large proportion of the tropical peat of the world is preserved. Um, it's uh, been mapped here by uh, partially remote means. And I suspect a fair bit of guesswork as to the depth of the peat, and it actually ignores a whole area of highland peat that is uh, quite prominent. But it shows you that um, at the moment the main forestry um, concessions are in this region here, with some limited along the rivers type peatlands, but so far haven't extended onto this smart <coughs> area where the um, problems of uh, oil palm would be much more extensive. Um, the peatlands really uh, may have a potential for um, earning income just by retaining the carbon store rather than releasing it to the world. And I'm sure the, um, um, the peat uh, pre preservation uh, part of the Department of Forestry will be uh, um, urging that, that process. Um, but uh, considerably more research has needed to be done. This is just a little uh, piece of research we've been doing in Papua New Guinea to really map the individual peatlands very carefully. This is just a GIS effort. And in fact, uh, we've only had very limited uh, ability to get into these peatlands, but uh, it's uh, at least uh, something to do in the future is to really work out how much carbon is in these systems. And that kind of work, as far as I'm aware, hasn't really been a achieved over most of uh, Papua. In fact, curiously, last night I got an email from um, a German guy who's working with the uh, uh, Jakarta Peak Group um, asking if I had any uh, data from Papua on peak depths. And I can give him plenty of highland uh, information, but nothing much from the bottom. So finally, moving on to another topic, which is uh, roads i was very interested to uh, I've, originally i walked up to lake habima and did work in that region uh, and there was this road didn't exist and um, then suddenly in uh, must have been 2001 i uh, walked up and came across this road not too long after it had been put in and it's now uh, of course uh, this is the source road to the road that now goes south to Naduga, which was referred to uh, earlier and as i I understand from the web, this is called the Sorong Marauki Road. The intention is to have a road going right along the spine of the island with a branch off to Jayapura, I presume, and other roads going all the way down to Marauki. So it's an incredibly ambitious project in the sense that um, uh, Papua New Guinea has no such uh, plans in train or intentions of trying to do such a thing. Um, and... Part of their reasoning is that they just would never be able to afford the maintenance of such a road. Um, but um, there's an amazing can-do attitude right throughout Indonesia, as I've seen in many islands and places where the locals get out there and do it. And it's a love in the case of local roads, it's it's an amazing um, um, display of uh, self-reliance with some help from the state, like they provide road and barrels of tar and things, and suddenly you've got a fairly bumpy, but uh, roads that go everywhere. Um, so I'm, I'm full of admiration for that, but uh, I think this road has been rather poorly poured, thought out, and at least from my own um, knowledge of uh, some of the environments in Papua, um, clearly it's being imposed without any particularly good idea of what the local environments are and how sensitive they are to various kinds of disturbance. So I'm uh, fully in support of an appeal by Wali, um, who questioned the Sorong Maraki Trans Papua Road, which they told me has a um, projected increase of 470 kilometres in the 2002 to 2005 period. The total length of the road will be 3,416 kilometres. Um, and they have actually asked the Department of Planning in Jakarta for details of who's thought up this road, what are the planning documents, how is it um, being projected. 
and they announced rather sadly on their website that uh, even though the government department is supposed to respond within 10 days, they haven't had an answer yet. Um, so I'll finish by just saying that maybe, I mean, this is a very quick gallop through some of the environmental concerns, but, um, and I'm certainly not the person to comment on the balance between um, development and poverty, but uh, it does seem to me that the outstanding um, um, questions are really uh, what can we do in the balance and uh, the call by Wiley and a number of other NGOs is really is to improve local land tenure controls. Um, there is such a contrast between Papua New Guinea and its uh, customary ownership of land that is claimed versus the Indonesian uh, state rule of lands that are apparently unoccupied, even if they're utilised by local populations. Um, <clears throat> that uh, some kind of middle ground should be needed. The land tenure system in Papua New Guinea has been strongly criticised by neoconservatives because they say that doesn't allow for capital accumulation and uh, and proper planning. And it's true that there are eternal arguments about land use in Papua New Guinea, which it would be lovely to avoid. But uh, I do, my own opinion is that the land tenure rules that apply particularly to Papua have been um, misused. A uh, second suggestion would be to create much more visibility in planning. I've given you the road example, but uh, I can see that there's a great deal of unhappiness about the um, uh, oil palm developments in that most people aren't aware of what's happening until after it's happened. Um, one suggestion I notice on one of the websites is that the military uh, not be invited in to provide security for these projects. This would force the uh, owners of the projects to uh, negotiate much more uh, honestly and directly with the local landholders. Um, and uh, maybe it would reduce some of the uh, well-known problems of having uh, military participation in the economic development, um, which seems to lead to some siphoning off of uh, profits by all accounts. Again, not my area of expertise. Um, this third point I'd like to make is um, is one we could argue about. As, as I say, I'm in some ways a colonialist in that uh, I come from a Western university and I have had the privilege of uh, learning a lot about the flora and fauna of uh, places. Um, and if you like, I'm a kind of a luxury, which people have argued they can't afford in a poorer country. Um, and it's true that much of the science that has been done in uh, Papua has been done by foreigners, which is a, a great pity. I think it's improved a lot. Uh, and I work well with people from University of Chendrawasi. Although echoing Jenny's um, comments, I, I'm sorry to say that virtually the majority of the people I've worked with over the years in um, Papua have died much younger than I am. So it's um, one of those uh, very sad facts that you have to pour a lot in. But uh, And I know that Lipi have a have an office in Wamana now. I've never been there, but um, presumably there's more effort being done. But a lot of the botanical work I'm aware comes from the um, Bogor on, on sort of expedition level. I really think Papua, the two provinces, should have their own um, environmental surveys and uh, and uh, setups to so that really the understanding of the development is based on uh, much better science than has been possible up till now, which all in turn suggests much less top-down planning, and that's kind of a, a moral I might have drawn from some of the other talks too, that uh, much more uh, interaction between the people being planned for and the planning. And finally, um, the knotty question of uh, justice in uh, Papua, um, people make a lot of rules. We have some excellent uh, reserve system in on paper in um, Papua or anywhere, I think also in Papua, West Papua. Um, some of those reserves such as the Lawrence National Park are, are just uh, absolute mind blowing uh, um, efforts, but the uh, resources put into their management or uh, utilization is, is really, uh, very sad, just 
Park is the same size as Kakadu National Park in uh, Australia. National Park in Australia has or had before COVID uh, visitations in the 300,000 people a year. I mentioned the uh, visitation to the Lawrence National Park to be measured in hundreds or thousands and uh, requires an incredible amount of uh, work to uh, get to it. So there are possibilities there, but if you're going to create national parks or reserve systems or declare um, conservation forests, then um, some larger effort has to be put into keeping the rules. But with those depressing notes, I would uh, simply say um, it's a work in progress, as Park Freddie said, and uh, I think there's, uh, it's such a fantastic country. Some of you might wonder why Australians would be working in area, and of course we've got an advantage in that it's at least partially uh, an area and uh, Papua New Guinea and Australia are the one landmass and uh, hence have a common uh, evolutional history and much of the same flora and fauna. So it's rather more uh, lazy of me to work in uh, Papua than to work in, say, Kalimantan with a totally Asian flora. Um, but I'll just finish with a note uh, that uh, I'm still working on a number of Papuan uh, materials, but I don't suppose I'll be uh, able to go back there again. But uh, there's a huge... Uh, gap there really the, the science hasn't um well you know i've done a, my little bit but i haven't really been replaced and there aren't a lot of uh, people seeming to replace me but i think that situation will improve so thanks very much thank you very much uh, professor hope especially this uh, very last concluding remark uh, i'm so you know uh, i'm standing with, with this uh, I may maybe on my final approach, but Papua still needs you. Thank you very, very much for that. And um, well, the idea uh, reminded by Professor Hope is that uh, uh, Papua de development is is there, um, and unfortunately, it has uh, costed a lot for our environment in terms of the uh, forest cover loss, especially in the uh, 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 peatland. But uh, uh, Thankfully, as well, Professor Ho uh, has come with some of the uh, uh, proposal in uh, or by improving the uh, local and tenure uh, as well as the uh, participation um, to uh, also en uh, enforce uh, a more uh, or, or less top-down uh, planning practices, uh, which is currently very much uh, top-down. Also, more investment in uh, in knowledge and uh, how enforce uh, the, the rules in a consistent way. So uh, again, thank you very much for having uh, shared your uh, expertise in this area with us. And now, um, before we turn into question and answer, and we have a lot of questions uh, raised so far in the chat room, I would like to uh, invite Ambassador uh, Imran Kotan because he's uh, about to leave for some other business. Uh, he asked me to have, uh, you know, uh, a commentary, a uh, short commentary. So, uh, uh, Ambassador Kotan, the time is yours. Well, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak uh, in this very distinguished uh, forum. Uh, may I start by uh, offering my sincere thanks to all speakers, uh, Freddie, uh, Richard, Ibu Jenny, as well as uh, Geoffrey for your your insights. I'm very uh, happy that you continue focusing on the uh, Papua's uh, question, uh, in particular, uh, probably generally uh, on Indonesia as well. I uh, just want to underline a couple of points uh, touched upon by all speakers. Number one is, I uh, just uh, listened a few weeks ago directly uh, from the horse's mouth that the autonomy fund will be increased uh, in the next uh, fiscal year. That, uh, roughly, those two provinces will receive uh, around 15 billion uh, US dollar. I think uh, if, for example, uh, this fund would uh, be directly uh, 
distribute it to the Papuans, I think they would have been the richest men in the world. But anyway, uh, I think there are some regulations or laws governing the usage of this uh, uh, autonomy fund. That is the law number 21 of 2001. And uh, currently, uh, debates are going on on whether or not to continue uh, this law. Some rejected, some uh, supported the continuation of this uh, uh, fund to the uh, next fiscal year. But uh, let me also try to highlight some of the points uh, touched upon by this law. Actually, this law regulates four main uh, subjects. Number one is the formation of the ad hoc uh, uh, human rights tribunal. And the second one is the formation of uh, local political parties. And the third one is the formation of what they call as truth and reconciliation committee. We fail on those three points, unfortunately. But the current discussion has been uh, focused on the usage of the space of fun. Let us uh, uh, remind ourselves that the fund is actually designed to uh, fund for strategic sectors. Number one, as Jenny mentioned, is about the health. And second one is about economy, but Richard also mentioned. And then also the infrastructure, but Freddie also mentioned. And the fourth one is about how to develop the local economy. Those are the four strategic uh, uh, sectors uh, that are uh, meant to be developed by the distribution of the spatial fund. Now, let me uh, briefly uh, brief you about the current situation in Papua. And I say this with some uh, authoritative uh, experience because uh, I have visited uh, Papua on a number of occasions, uh, have been in contact with uh, some key players in the region. Actually, uh, last week I met with two noted uh, religious leaders. They mentioned actually the willingness of the central government to develop Papua is absolutely sincere and genuine. The problem is the local elites use this uh, special fund for their own purposes, self-interest purposes, mm -hmm. other than those as stipulated in the law, as I mentioned, to develop those four strategic sectors. And uh, those two uh, noted religious leaders stated to me loud and clear, Pa Imran, if the central government is firm enough to implement a stringent verification system, they believe that all those issues will disappear. Uh, currently, as we speak, there is no stringent verification system put in place either by the central as well as the local governments. We have to admit that. We have to be sincere to ourselves. So they said, those two uh, noted uh, religious leaders said that uh, actually oh. if the central government is determined enough to put in place a stringent verification system to verify the usage of this space of fund, the oh. issue will be easily uh, dealt with. Uh, uh, in Papua. Currently, I have to admit that the situation in situ 
in Papua is a bit chaotic. If we say that everything is okay in Papua, basically we are lying. But then again, we need to really uh, try to find the core problem. Why is it so? And according to my finding, I, as I said, I have visited uh, uh, Papua on a number of occasions. I have uh, interacted with uh, local authorities as well as uh, local wise men, so to speak. They came up with the same idea. Please put in place a stringent verification system either internally by our government or externally by, say, for example, KPK and the rest. Then we will know who misused the fund and how to deal with them accordingly. I think according to uh, those who, have, uh, who I have consulted, each and every single book party as well as Walikota, probably governor, should be held accountable for that matter. It's really concerning. That is why I think this webinar is very important to try to draw the attention of the local as well as central government on how important it is to put in place a stringent verification system so there will be no misusage of special fund in the next fiscal year. And of course, uh, the special fund is designed also to, uh, 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 to uh, develop the, the education of the Papuans because one of the, uh, uh, one of the issues uh, that we need to focus on is how to develop the human resources of Papua in order to be able to run the regions in a manner that is uh, compatible with uh, transparency as well as accountability applied uh, in the rest of Indonesia. As uh, we speak now, I have sponsored around 30 Personally, I have sponsored around 30 Papuan students to study in Jakarta. And that is my small contribution. I always mention I love Papua because I have been associated with this region back since uh, 2002 when I was Indonesian ambassador to Australia. I was summoned to parliament. There were only two Indonesian ambassadors, you know, uh, brave enough to come and brief the parliament. One among those is me, and the other one is the late ambassador, Sabam Siagian. And those two are all Bhutanese. So we don't have any handicap to deal with Australians. Sorry, <laughs> Bujeni, Pak Richard, and Pak Geoffrey. Okay, uh, but uh, anyway, uh, education is very key in terms of developing uh, 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 Papua. And I think uh, if, we, uh, if we are able enough to, uh, to, to really supervise the implementation of this program, the special autonomy program, I think uh, Papua will be as, uh, you know, as, 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 as good as other uh, provinces uh, in Indonesia. And that... I think uh, not only depends on the central government, but as well as on the uh, local government and the local uh, people, the Papuans. So uh, probably uh, I need to stop at this point, but uh, again, thank you very much for organizing this uh, webinar. So we can, uh, I hope that the organizing committee can connect with our embassy, probably in Canberra or in our consulate generals everywhere, everywhere in Australia to try to convey the message that we are discussing uh, just to enrich the discussion on Papua at the national level as to allow Papua and 
uh, Papuans to progress, to excel into a much brighter future uh, in the years to come. Thank you very much. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, Patri. So thank you very much, uh, uh, Ambassador Kotan, for having shared with, with us some of the, uh, uh, of the thoughts uh, based on uh, experience. And I remember sharing, uh, you know, one of the dif difficult time with uh, Mr. Ambassador in Vanuatu when we are speaking about something on Indonesia and then all of a sudden Indonesian flag uh, was uh, was put down by uh, by some Vanuatu. So uh, good luck, Pa. Uh, and uh, if you uh, uh, have to uh, leave us, then again, thank you very much. You have a good day. Thank now, you. Uh, now uh, let me ask uh, Bu Evi uh, yes. to distribute the uh, uh, question or comments uh, shared by participants in the chat room. Uh, Bu Evi, the time is yours. Uh, yes, this is for Pak Freddy. Uh, you can hear me, Pak. Hello. Okay, maybe uh, for another questions for uh, for panelists is from uh, Maida Mayra Enda. I'm going to raise the followings in the, uh, sorry, uh, what kind of military approach in the future for better Papua? And then the questions only for Pap Freddy, what kind of requirements uh, strategy to mon monitor for the implementations of OTSUS in each regency and the district? And from Jacob for four speaker, given the complex, uh, sorry, complexity uh, of the problem in the social, political, health, and environmental, economic, education, cultural aspect, uh, cultural aspect Papuan and are facing, is there any concrete actionable step taken by the concerned international community to assist Papuan or simply living, uh, sorry, or simply leaving this problem to the Indonesian government to do whatever Ooh. it wants. That's the question from Jacob. Is that, uh, you can clear my... Uh, uh, yes, we, we, can, we can hear you. Uh, go okay. ahead. Yeah, uh, and then uh, only for pra, pra Freddy is uh, is about that. Uh, is that uh, the late president Gus Dur uh, what do you think about the uh, President Gus Dur about the use of the Bintang Kejora flag? Is that still relevant or uh, still sensitive uh, noise days? Or bin Bintang Kejora flag is only the symbol of culture? So, Pak Freddy, you can hear me clearly? Maybe Yahya? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. All right, yeah. Thank so you. So I much. can explain about that. Yes, uh, sir. Please, sir. Are, are there all the, the okay? The uh, thank you for the for the time given. Okay, please go ahead, Father Freddy. Yeah. Yes, Father Freddy, you may go ahead. Okay. <laughs> I will back to the. I can hear you. I can hear. You. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Father Freddy. Hello, can you? Yes, okay, then I will explain. I'll be back to 20 September 1960. 20 September 1960. There is a speech of Queen Juliana. At the time, the province was called, was called Netherlands Nihunea. After the, after the meeting in, uh, in The Hague, December 1949, and then in the 19, uh, then the, the dispute running on about this colony, uh, which is belongs to the Netherlands Indians at the time. And then in 20 September 1960, 
Queen Juliana made her in, in her speech as follows: In the in the coming year, Netherlands Nihonia will enter an important new phase in its development towards towards self determination. For as soon as the Nihonia Council, Nihuni Council, which will consist in the main of representative of the native population, has been set up. Administration legislation will be possible only with the cooperation with the Dutch. Based on this speech, the governor at the time is the governor Platteel, issued local province decree, governor decree about the cultural flag and the folk lead. All the cultural song, cultural flag is bintang kejora, and the cultural song is Haitano ku Papua. At that time, everybody is singing that. Oh, it's a national anthem. Oh, it's a national, uh, how do you call it, a na national flag. No. When it's national anthem or national flag. It must be issued by the queen, not the governor. That is only clear. Who knows? Understand the government uh, government procedure? Eh? It's clear like that. It's not issued by the by the queen, but it issued by the governor, because it has relation with the cultural, uh, the flag cu cultural flag who shows, and the cultural song. Papua. But everybody in Papua until now, they understood, they understand it as a, oh, this is a national flag and this is a national anthem. No, it's wrong. Why it is like that? Because the government, the Dutch policy is like at the time, they make all the provinces abroad, they call it uh, like Suriname. Curaçao, Aruba, Saint Martin, all these provinces are under Netherlands uh, govern, gov, uh, government. As their provinces abroad, they have an own minister concerning these provinces abroad, outside of the Dutch, outside of the Netherlands. That is the policy. They want not to leave foothold in Pacific area. They want to need not to leave that because Indonesia is already independent. That's why they keep Papua as their province in the long run to put all their interest inside Papua. And this is the mistake. And that mistake become miserable to all Papuans until now. Everybody think that one December at that time, because the issue also the Recommendation that 1 December 1960, everybody can hoist that flag. When Gus Dur asked me about this, I explained President Gus Dur about this. It's not a national flag. It's a cultural flag. It's a cultural, uh, cultural song about how grace, how grace is God Uh, bless, bless the province with, with abundance of uh, research, resources. And everybody in Papua until now, the next generation come, everybody saying, oh, it is the Independence Day of Papua. And it is the mistake that we make. Because everybody doesn't know the exact history about this matter. That's why I mentioned it. Indonesian people in all, especially the Papuans, must know exactly the nature, the anatomy of the historical background starting in 1828 about this colony. In 1848, 45, they separated between Papua, New Guinea, and, and uh, the Dutch New Guinea. They separated. Papua New Guinea belongs to 
at that time belongs to Australia and Germany. Germany get in the north and in the southern part, Australia get it. And in this case, Britain. So if you go back, flashback to this history, when nobody, when everybody doesn't know exactly about this history itself, they make always issues about independence and so on. It's very sorry that about that, that everybody doesn't know about exactly. The political issue at the time from the Dutch issue is to have a foothold in the Pacific area. And that is the only chance to keep Papua for their own business. And that's why Sukarno became a Trikora and so on. So I think that is uh, that is clear eh, for the history. That's why President Gusdor want to uh, to to announce the the, uh, the the name of Papua again for the province based on the cultural, not based on the politics. And the other side, there is another question about what is in the wrong ground. There there must be a reform done by this government about the military process and the security process and so on and so on. There must be a reform. If not, we will all, always face the, uh, how do you call it, international, called, uh, always issue about the human violation, violation in Papua. Thank you. <laughs> That's all. Effie, I give it back to the moderator. Okay, thank you, Pap Freddy. Yes, maybe other speakers. Uh, we reply uh, for another questions from Myra and Jacob. Ibu Evi, pertanyaan saya ke Pak Numberi belum dibahas, coba. Oh, okay, sebentar ya Pak ya. So, yeah, uh, for for all the speaker, what kind of military approach in the future for better Papua? Okay, I will answer it. I will answer it. Okay, Pak. Please. The Indonesian government already uh, followed the international law about human rights and so on. We already issued the uh, Indonesian law about that. But so far, there is always not following that. In peacetime, actually, it might be not a military operation, but it's a police operation related to establish uh, the the established of a, how do you call it uh, for the people, eh? not the military operation, and that is clear in all that uh, all that uh, decree and all that law that we 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 undersigned internationally and also we issued in locally in, in terms of Indonesian law. So I think we have to follow that. If we follow that clearly, then we can make we can we we can't make mistakes in the in the future. Thank you. Okay. This operation in peacetime must be done by police, not by the military. It's clear like that. Okay. Any other comments from uh, from Mr. Richard or Jenny? Perhaps I could um, <clears throat> comment on the, the, the issue of um, the appropriate um, military response. Yeah. I, I very much agree with, with that, Freddie, that it is a case where reform is needed. And if I look at the comments from responsible ministers uh, at the time of the uh, widespread uh, de de demonstrations in in August of September of uh, last year and 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 subsequently, I think that there's a if I cor <clears throat> detect correctly um, an ambivalence and ambiguity. Uh, many ministers, and I'm thinking of the the current um, Menko Polkam, but uh, but them him. The Indonesian, the Indonesian government is not pursuing a security approach, the Dekatan Kaamana. 
Mm-hmm. And it's a kubudaya an or, or uh, sectoral. There's there's lots of it. You get the sense that it is, it's looking for euphemisms. Essentially, the when when uh, both Mahfud and prior to prior to him, the former uh, defence minister, uh, former general Ramisan. Have, have, appro- have responded to the um, appeals requests from various politicians and, and government leaders in Papua that uh, Indonesian security forces should be withdrawn from, pa- from Papua or pa- parts of Papua. Uh, the response is to say that this is not possible. Uh, that, that, that there is... Um, General Ramisad went to the went to the extent that, it, in in perhaps a, an un, unintended um, uh, side comment, that of course we couldn't, of course Indonesia couldn't withdraw its um, uh, military forces. Papua would become independent. So it it it, it was in a, in a sense an unintended recognition of the importance of the security forces in the eyes of those responsible ministers in Jakarta for maintaining Indonesian authority in, in, in Papua. And I think in, 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 in this light, um, I think that this gets to the, in, in a sense, one, one of the, 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 core, uh, the, the core issues. How, how does the national government uh, govern a region like Papua, where there is an element of the population, a section of the population, uh, who was opposed to Indonesian rule, uh, and that you know what in developing the the governance mechanisms, uh, you know what what is the role of the security forces in those circumstances, and if we look back all the way to nineteen. 19- 1963, uh, at no point in time has either the armed or peaceful resistance by Papuans ever threatened Indonesian control from 1953 to, 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 to today. But in a, you know, the dilemma faced by the, the, na- the national government uh, is that uh, the me- you know, one of the key strategies used to maintain authority has been the deployment of security forces. And if we look at the central government's response to the killings in Nduga, the demonstrations in August or September last year, more troops were, uh, were, were sent. If we look at the uh, analysis that um, the, the LEPI has done, in a sense, the, the, the use of the security forces to maintain authority uh, is also one of the factors uh, that, that fuels Papuan national identity and the desire of many Papuans uh, to leave Indonesia. So it's, in a sense, a, a dilemma mm-hmm. uh, that the, the, the national government is, 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 is confronted with. And it, it is that sense of I suppose self-doubt that without a significant deployment of security forces, uh, that the national government is no longer able to control Papua. And I think that 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 that's the the dilemma that uh, I think national governments have been um, have been 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 struggling with, certainly since the fall of Suharto, and in in some senses before then. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Richard. Maybe uh, Dr. Hope and let, Jenny, if you want to add. Me, let me underline some. Uh, some. Yes, I want to add uh, okay. what uh, uh, Dr. Richard mentioned. So there is, there, maybe I think that my explanation is not enough. I want to tell everybody, also the, 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 the how, how do you call it, the guests, and so on, yes. the participant, participants, there are three three requirements according to international law, and we are already 
uh, stipulated by Indonesian law of military operations. Military operation is necessary when the enemy is structured in a way like professional military organization. I, I, I mentioned one, once again, the military operation must be involved in terms of if the enemy is structured like professional military organization. The question is, these uh, OPM and so on, are they like that, structured like that? I think not. The second, are they occupying a certain area in Papua for years? That is a, the second condition for military operation. If not, then forget this military operation. The third, they attack must be fully and intensive, not sporadical. Sporadical, it means bandit. Bandit, you cannot classify them as uh, national enemies. They are bandits. So it's clear like that. We are already stipulated in Indonesian law about the international standard for military operation in peacetime. Thank you. I give it back to the moderator. Um, Thank okay. you, Effie. Thank you. Papa. It's clear like that, my explanation. Yes. It's very clear, my explanation sir. Is clear. Yes. Yes. Clear. Okay. Yes, maybe uh, Effie, another. You may, you may also uh, give some time to Bu Jenny because there are yes. few uh, to Bu Jenny. Yeah, uh, and, yes, uh, I can see that Bujeni has also responded <laughs> to the uh, chat room, but uh, well, I, I'm still thinking that uh, Bujeni needs to say a few words on uh, on those uh, those comments. So please, Bujeni. All right, thank you. Um, yeah, there's a few comments I replied to in the chat because I wasn't sure if we would have time to talk about them, and I just wanted to thank the people for and you know for asking such interesting questions. Um, I think just to the the question about the military, I guess, was directed to all of us. Um, and the only thing I could add there really is just to I guess reiterate the, the health effects of militarization and and violence and displacement, um, you know, um, effects on civilians and also the, this kind of loss of faith in the, the, the government, the state, as, you know, going to protect Papuan lives that comes about as a result of, even if they are supposedly kind of random, uh, you know, so-called clashes, or if there are, um, you know, sometimes we hear that uh, milit soldiers go, you know, do something outside of what they've been told to do. Even if those are, that is some of what happens, I think the loss of faith that people experience because of those, um, you know, insecure surroundings contributes to not just physical health problems, but mental health problems as well. Um, I'm just looking at the, which questions you want me to take up from the chat? There was a- uh, Especially the, uh, the culture, culture-based approach to deal with the uh, issue of health. Yes. A culture-based approach. Yes. I'm not sure. I think I've lost track of where it is in the chat, but that's okay. So I guess my I don't know, my thoughts on culture and health is, um, and, and especially, of course, Papua is very culturally diverse. So I'm not thinking about um, we need to develop like a checklist of cultural attributes and then try to, you know, develop a different policy or a different program for every, you know, aspect of cultural diversity that exists. Um, I'm not thinking about the cultural context in that way exactly. I'm thinking more about how since culture is dynamic and it's always changing um, and it is always contested and it takes, you know, people kind of participate in it. They shape it as well as it shapes us. So the cultural context I'm thinking about in terms of policy are probably more about bringing in and allowing space for local experiences 
for um, local lived lived you know, everyday lives, I suppose, for local people to have a strong role in those policy discussions and leading those policy discussions. Um, those kinds of things, I guess, the localization of the, the policy um, that could extend to the evidence base that we need to build culturally aware and um, effective policies that would include not just maybe uh, statistics or surveys, but also this kind of qualitative approach I was mentioning um, in terms of asking, you know, interviews or spending time to, with people to try to understand um, how these uh, services, for example, are not meeting their needs. So what are the issues? As uh, Sector mentioned in the chat in terms of HIV, we can see that even if Papua tests a large number of people, so there's some socialization and awareness is raised, a large number of people might undergo an HIV test. An even smaller number of people actually go for treatment. An even smaller number of people stay on the treatment and continue with the, the viral load counts. And then even a smaller number of people stay on the treatment long enough to um, you know, have the virus suppressed. So this is, there's sociocultural and uh, local everyday life. This includes livelihoods, economy, and other things that affect every step of that, that kind of chain. So those are the kinds of things we need to understand those and take those into account when we are considering how to improve um, health and education policies. Just while well, I wrap up, but one of the, um, one of the things I found talking to people about young people about their experiences going to school in Wamina is actually that um, it's not unfrequent that there's you know insecurity around the city and in the outskirts that actually you know in kind of hampers young people from going to school. So it's not just yes, sometimes the teachers are not there, yes, sometimes the facilities are also of poor quality, but the broader environment, you know, is there any food to eat in that house? Um, what is the, you know, the overall atmosphere in the household? And also what is the, the security atmosphere around? If there's soldiers patrolling or if something has happened and there's been some conflict, you know, the night before, then you don't see 10 year olds and 12 year olds going out to walk to school. And, and some of them are going some distance to school, right? People, um, so this, the overall security environment actually also has an impact on the health and education um, that people can participate in and access. Thank you. <laughs> okay. uh, maybe Professor Ho, you want to add something to respond for the questions? Professor no. has actually let, 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 let me add something. Let me okay. add something, please. Okay. There is a, there is a, a question also about in the long run. How about in the long run? Yeah. Let me reiterate what I said related to this security arrangement. It must be clear that the police must be stabilized, safety, security, and order in the region in peacetime. So it's clear like that because we already put stipulated in the in the in the Indonesian law like that. So we cannot force to put military operation in peacetime. That's why I told you already that it must be the security the security arrangement must be rearranged and put the police forward forward to stabilize the safety and security and order in peacetime. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. I give it back to the moderator. Thank you, Pat. Thank you, I give it back to the moderator. Yes. Yeah, if Mr. I Richard. Could, yeah, could, could I make a, a very, very brief comment? One is a, a, a sort of historical footnote on uh, yeah. Pat Freddie's very, very accurate and, and useful analysis of, of uh, dating from Queen Juliana's speech about Papua through to the uh, the governor's decisions about at uh, the end the end of, of 1961 and, uh, and and clearly the the Dutch didn't the Dutch authorities didn't think about Bindankajoro being uh, be, being a, a national flag of a of a of a, uh, of a new nation state. But I think even from that time. 
And if we if we we look at the manifesto politic uh, issued in 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 October 1961, and the, and the and the committee that put that manifesto together included uh, many, or I think all of them were were members of the uh, elected um, New Guinea Rad, the the New Guinea Council, uh, that uh, in fact. Was, was was created on the initiative of Queen Juliana's policies. Clearly, that group of people, you know, who who were broadly representative of the Papuan political elite of the uh, of the time, included pe people like Nicholas Yao and, uh, uh, and and others. That, in their view, they thought about it as a, the Bintangajora as a national flag, ra rather than the cultural representative. So, I think that the what Bafedi argued was a misunderstanding by Papuans about what the flag meant, I think has its origins at the time that it was created. Uh, and, and that I think that the, 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 the difference, and, and we can understand the Dutch authorities at the time not wanting to present uh, either the New Rad or the flag and the flag raising as in any attempt to uh, declare a nation state in Papua, and, and they were particularly cautious of that at the time when Joseph Luntz, the, the, the Netherlands foreign minister of the time, tried to, uh, to persuade the United Nations to take over the administration and decolonization of Papua, that they certainly didn't, the Dutch authorities, the governor in Papua and Netherlands, New Guinea itself, certainly didn't want to undermine the diplomatic strategies that the Netherlands was pursuing at the UN, and they certainly didn't want to provoke President Sukarno, which they ended up by by, by doing anyway. Um, but uh, you know, I, I think that those those two different interpretations about what the flag represented, you know, was it a national flag, was it a cultural symbol, I think go back to its very, uh, very, very origins. And if I could briefly comment on... Um, uh, on on Pa Imran's uh, Ambassador Imran Kotan's com com comments uh, ab about the local elite in Papua, the elected politicians and and and, and senior uh, and senior officials, and his argument was that they need the, their their use of the generous budget allocation under the special autonomy fund need to be you know they need to be held accountable and and so on. I think that that. Bring you know, raises a, a, a very important question about the the relationship between that government, you know, what what, what might be described as the cooperating elite. So by cooperating elite, I'm meaning the the Papuan elected officials, both at provincial and Kabupaten and Kota, uh, Kota level, as as well as, as well as the the the, the, the senior. Uh, senior officials, in in some ways, that they are looking at it from what I would imagine the the interests of the national government. They are an enormous asset. You know, they they are a, a group of the Papuan elite who have agreed to cooperate and be part of the Indonesian government system uh, in Papua. Uh, you know that 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 group of people has, in terms of numbers, expanded enormously and become much more regionally culturally diverse over the last twenty years. Significantly, as part of that of that um, <clears throat> Pemekaran process, the creation of of you know four times as many many district governments, so that they're 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 they're, they're local elites. I think it. It becomes um, uh, an <clears throat> by Imran's comment about these people being difficult to be being held accountable for the way they use the, the the special autonomy funds, in a sense, tells us something about the power relationship between those local elites and the national government in Jakarta. Uh, and quite a number of um, uh, of documents have been, have um, become become public um, 
which suggests that some people within the governing elites uh, in Jakarta over a number of different administrations from from Gustur through Megawati on, uh, onwards uh, are not entirely trusting of the political loyalties of some members of that uh, of, 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 of that elite. And I think that, that that in turn is related to the question um, <clears throat> that I raised earlier about the changes in the administrative structure, the process of of, of, uh, of, of Pamekaran, on what are, I think there have been a number of questions uh, about you know, what can be done about it, should more provinces be, be, uh, be created. I, I think that that the, I think that that issue of the administrative structures, both at provincial and, and Kabupat and Kota level, uh, need to be thought about and analysed in the context of the power relationship between the local cooperating elites in Papua and the national government. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rika. Uh, there is another question from YouTube channels. Uh, this is from Satrio Darmanto. Uh, for Dr. Richard and Dr. Jenny, is there an increase in welfare and uh, changes in the standard of living fell by the part one after the development of digital infrastructure by Bhakti uh, who drive with the, the under Ministry of uh, Information in Indonesia, the Kominfo. You'll answer the three chat. Is that clear? Look, I'm 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 not I'm not familiar uh, with any research that which is specifically related those to those two factors. Yeah. Of of, of increase yeah, Im improved yeah. communications. The, the improvement of dig, digital infrastructure and, and, and so on. And you know, what, what is the impact of those improvements in communication, better access to internet, et cetera, and, okay. and standards of living. I've never seen any, any, any data that can, can, I'm not saying it's unimportant, it clearly is important, but I'm, I'm not familiar with any, yeah, okay. uh, with any research on that. I think what, what we, we, we do know that uh, the provision of much better digital communications with Papua have certainly changed the flow of information uh, from about what's going on in Papua to the rest of Indonesia and, of course, the internet, the the the, the international uh, the international world. And I think that that you know just just reflecting. <clears throat> Just, just reflecting on on the, uh, uh, the 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 tens of webinars that have been taking place mm -hmm. in the um, in the context of um, in the context of the pandemic, uh, that there are, are many more Papuan voices yes. participating in those discussions, which, through their digital nature, are not only national; they're international. Mm -hmm. So I th I think the 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 political consequences and the the impact on government decision making uh, is is from you know the, the improvement of that digital communication and how that impacts on uh, on the government's decision making process. I think is something that we 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 do need to think about. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, maybe Pak Freddy want to add. Yeah, uh, I want to underline what uh, Dr. Richard mentioned and also Ambassador Imron mentioned about uh, speaking about the lack so far, so far until now, why, why the people refused autonomy, spatial autonomy, because there is no supervision and coaching Supervision and coaching. There is a lack of supervision and coaching from the central government. They only put down the money, and they say, "Okay, this is your money, governor. Do it what you will." 
and distributed to the, all the regency. There is no a pattern to confirm how they distribute the money and there is no supervision and coaching about this. In totally, there is no controlling the flow of spatial autonomy budget. It's a huge of budget, yeah? it's a huge of money. It's about 1880, 80 trillion, I don't know in, 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 a, in dollars about, but, but 8 trillion rupees, which they distribute to the, to the two provinces, starting from 2002 until 2019. Why the people refuse it? Because not, nothing is achieved. And most of them, they shout it out and they think, oh, it's, it's corrupted by, by Jakarta or by Papua itself and so on. So what I see on the, on the ground level, according to my opinion, is there is no supervision and coaching how to distribute the money. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Pak Freddy. Uh, maybe I also want to add uh, that uh, Dr. Richard say that uh, about the Papuans uh, using the connectivities uh, for, uh, especially in this pandemic era, yeah. Uh, that uh, we, in here, we, uh, we already have some discussions about the, uh, Papua issue, uh, starting from history, culture, and even tourism before. And uh, that's uh, also invite the participation from Papua, even uh, from ASMAT before that region is very difficult to reach. Yeah, uh, that's a super, uh, surprise us. Yeah, uh, even there are a big rain in ASMAT uh, at the moment, uh, at the time, yeah, uh, when we are even when we uh, discuss about the, the book, about the, how is the, the doctor uh, have a, a running the, socials, uh, the social aid uh, for the asthma people uh, last month. And they, uh, they, can, they can connect uh, very clearly, even so uh, there is no problem with connectivity. So uh, it's really been a lot, yeah, uh, the infrastructure, development, uh, especially for the uh, accessible uh, connectivity uh, for the telecommunication is very uh, crucial. And uh, it's, uh, we see that's uh, really uh, developed in the last five years, uh, have a progress and so we can feel that uh, the Papua is now, is like uh, really close to Jakarta and so, um, we can reach uh, because uh, my background is a tour operator, uh, Mr. Richard. Uh, so I, uh, events, my destinations uh, can reach Korowai people uh, under asthma region. Uh, before I use a satellite phone, but now we can use a mobile phone. That's a simple, simple example. Yeah, that's uh, uh, the connectivity, especially for the, uh, the facilities of uh, Technology, uh, communication technology is already running there and uh, they can use that uh, with pop one. Okay, uh, another last question from Denny, from Denny Raja Guguk. Uh, what do you think Mr. Richard and Pak Freddy, uh, what is the best uh, strategy for Papua branding countering the negative image at the international level? That's the last questions, yeah, before we close this discussion okay uh, let me let me underline this failure to take advantage of the current window of opportunity under the leadership of president jokowi yeah. will prolong the suffering of the papuan people once again i underline it failure to take advantage of the current window of opportunity under the leadership of President Jokowi will prolong the suffering of the Papuan people. The next coming four years are critical period in which the government and Papuan should embark on both initiative toward peace 
before the next 2024 president election, president and legislative election begin looming on the horizon. It means that we have to put all effort together in achieving Papua as a piece of as as peace, peace. Uh, in context of the development. It must be peaceful. If there is still GPKs and so on, we cannot achieve it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pat Freddy. Uh, Mr. Richard? Yeah, th thank you. Um, I think it is re re related to the, um, to, the, to the issue of digital communication and the improvements mm -hmm. of digital communication. So I think in terms about how the international community thinks about you know, both governments and, and civil societies, mm -hmm. thinks about what's going on in Papua. Uh, Kamenlu, the Indonesian government, Indonesian diplomats, no longer have a monopoly of information and, and really haven't had a monopoly of information for quite a long while. But I think I think with with the the improvement of access to the internet and so on in in you know as you were saying even in places like Asmat yes. uh, me, me, means that um, presenting for the Indonesian government Kamenlu presenting the desired image to the international community mm -hmm. that that is now a competitive process you know that there are other people both in Papua itself uh, as, as well as uh, organizations like the UNWP, Benny Wender and his, his colleagues competing with the Indonesian government about how Papua is thought about within the international community. Uh, and you know, I'm by no, no means um, uh, cl claiming to be uh, uh, somebody who can develop diplomatic strategies, but I'm, what I'm suggesting uh, is, is that Kamenlu is, is, is now confronted with a much more complex communication process. Yeah. Uh, given that their interlocutor in forum for, for, to, for the UN, uh, their sole source of information about what's going on in Papua is no longer controlled by Indonesian diplomats. And I think that, that that requires a slightly different approach, slightly different strategies that mm -hmm. have to be devised in the knowledge that the people they're talking to have, have a much more diverse array of information about developments in Papua. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I give it back to Gabriel. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, by Effie, for uh, you know, having organized this. Hello, Effie. Yes, sir, Pa. No, 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 no. Happy, happy, please, 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 Effie. Yeah. Please, please Effie. Silakan, Papa, ready. Please, Effie. Yes. Yeah, I want to underline what uh, Dr. Richard mentioned. Please, please give me time. Only, 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 only one minute. Yeah, thank you. Papa. Please. Okay. I think what uh, Dr. Richard mentioned. I think I think what Dr. Richard mentioned about the international community is right. The international community must continue to support the Papuan peace process. The international community must continue to support the Papuan peace process. And they must also engage constructively with the Indonesian government. On the other side, they have to support the governance reforms in Papua. And the last is support accountability, accountable, accountability and sustainability management of Papua, Papua resources. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pa Freddy. Well, thank you very much, uh, Pa Freddy. I was about to ask you to uh, give some uh, closing statement, but I guess the three points uh, are already your uh, closing statement. My closing statement, thank you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Maybe... <laughs> Maybe a couple of seconds for Parichat for closing statement. <laughs> I think I, I think I've probably had quite a number of closing <laughs> statements, <laughs> but, but I, I I think I'm in in this in, in strong agreement. Much of what 
uh, Fedi has been arguing about the the importance of dialogue uh, yeah. with with various sections of the Papuan community and also the non-Papuan community in Papua, uh, with not only with their own governments, uh, but with the national government in, in, in Jakarta as well. But uh, I think it is only through that 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 process of whether whether it is um, destruct, con constructive discussion, I think it was one one of um, President Yudhiono's term um, or uh, patent uh, approach of the the the, the, the leapy dialogue approaches to, um, as uh, as previously developed. You know there are a number of options, but I think that the you know, sim I think simultaneously with greater communication with the international community, I think that there has to be greater in engagement between the national uh, government authorities in Jakarta and various sections of, uh, of uh, society in Papua. Thank you. Thank you very much, Parichat. Uh, and that would be uh, the last uh, the final uh, closing statement for uh, from all the speakers, uh, Professor Jenny and also Professor uh, uh, Hope have left us uh, left us for uh, another meeting. But uh, as the moderator of this uh, discussion, uh, I would like to raise uh, four points only out of this uh, uh, discussion. The first one is uh, again to uh, echo what uh, uh, Richard has just mentioned, the importance of dialogue. Uh, the other one is, uh, you know, uh, we need a better understanding uh, of the uh, history of uh, Papua as part of, you know, uh, understanding the history of Indonesia. Uh, the other one is the importance of uh, putting everything, including development, in the context of, uh, of culture, because Papua has a very a specific uh, culture, and then last but not least, is uh, the importance of uh, of uh, uh, of participation in undertaking all development initiatives, including the one uh, currently uh, organized under the uh, autonomy Kusus policy. And uh, by that, I would like to end this uh, discussion. As the moderator, I would like to apolo uh, apologize if uh, there is uh, 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 anything that uh, we cannot. Um, really uh, perform as uh, expected, uh, including the uh, technical problems that we have uh, we, uh, yes. at the beginning of this uh, session. Uh, and uh, again, thank you very much for all the speakers, uh, especially Parichat and uh, uh, Freddy for uh, still being with us uh, up to this hour. And also for all the uh, participants for uh, you no know, many comments, uh, question, and, and as well as sharing through the uh, chat room. Um, so thank you very much again. And then uh, to close this uh, discussion, I would like uh, to uh, ask uh, pa Teddy, uh, Professor Teddy Mantoro as the organizer of this uh, uh, discussion to uh, give a few words and then uh, as well close uh, the discussion. So pa Teddy, the time is yours. Okay, thank you, Pak Gebi. Uh, did you uh, uh, clearly hear my voice? Yes. Okay, thank you. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, I would like to thanks to everyone who, who participated to this conference, uh, this webinar until in the end of uh, this time, yeah, until 43 at the moment. So, so let me give you some little bit background about this. Uh, okay. So previously we running uh, uh, also similar web webinar uh, that also uh, about the current development status of Papua. Previously, we concentrate to the uh, to the people, development of the people, and then the economic, and then the, the infrastructure. All right. And at that time, we invite like couple uh, uh, very uh, 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 what do you call the uh, uh, very uh, uh, impressive uh, uh, speaker at that time, uh, uh, like Sidney Jones at that time, Owen Podger, Billy Membraska, the staff of the presidents. Uh, and also uh, the uh, uh, Pak uh, Simon Tabuni from Papua uh, Muda Inspirative. And then for the topic from today, as, as we already uh, uh, here together, we uh, we try to concentrate actually to digital infrastructure to help and to the, to the uh, natural resources. Really unfortunate for today, the uh, digital infrastructure will not go to the deep. So hopefully 
in the near future we going we can uh, again continue uh, for to have another uh, webinar in relation to the digital infrastructure for example we also interest about the food that um, already mentioned earlier with with uh, with, uh, with, uh, with ambassador uh, freddy before <coughs> and also uh, maybe we'll go to uh, more uh, uh, deep in the in the especially to the road infrastructure not other other uh, other infrastructure all right so with that i would like to thanks again to pa richard uh, uh, uh from uh, university of sydney and then to dr jenny munro from university of queensland Uh, Professor Dr. Jeff Hope from uh, Ars Ars National University, and of of course to the uh, Ambassador uh, Freddy Numberi. And um, it's sur surprising me actually, um, I saw a couple of us actually came from graduated from the same university. So Jenny just Dr. Jenny just mentioned he she graduated from ANU back to 2010. Actually, Pak Gebi also graduated from ANU. And me myself also spent like 10 years at the ANU. I was the lecturer also over there in computer science area. And then, <laughs> and this one more actually. So Jenny uh, Jeff also graduated from ANU, and still one more, uh, uh, Dr. Ariana Utomo. She is also the the lecturer and at the University of Melbourne. He come up uh, for for a moment, but after some time, she left. Really unfortunate. All right. Oh, some of you uh, ask me what is the uh, uh, Mandalawangi and what is the relation with the Pap uh, Papua issue. So let me sharing a little bit to you about the uh, Yayasan Mandalawangi. So Yayasan Mandalawangi was built back to uh, 23rd of September uh, to 2002. Uh, we developed this uh, Yayasan in Canberra actually. Pak Gebi was there at that time. And uh, every time there is some disaster in Indonesia, We as the Indonesian community, they are willing to help. Especially, we interest in in education, basically. So we collect a lot of funding, actually, from many sources, not from our packet or our pocket money. So now we uh, have already around 670 people with the scholarship, full scholarship, and um, uh, from Aceh until Sorong. Not big number, by the way, but the, we started since 2002. So and also a couple people we. Uh, we uh, we supported uh, in in Sorong starting from uh, primary high school until master degree level. Now we have like two currently uh, working in uh, master degree level for uh, uh, STEM area. All right, and then um, let me share a little bit with you uh, in relation to, uh, to to Papua because I still have a feeling that a lot of people uh, looking uh, 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 Papua is like. Uh, a, 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 be, a backward uh, province. For me, it's not like that way. All right. So uh, let me sharing a little bit of my uh, experience before. So back to 1990, I managed to go to the top of the mountain of uh, Gunung Tengah in Papua. I think almost similar experience with Pak Jeff. So in my case, I go to the uh, to the uh, 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 Wilhelmina Peak in uh, Trikora, and then one years after that, I Uh, I went to uh, Bintuni for helping uh, people to to doing uh, to to search where uh, one aircraft was fell down at the time. The uh, belong to Marpati, and then from there, then I I, I see some 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 situation uh, around 90s. And about two years ago, 19 years after I visit for quite some time at the time, I'm running one international conference. Uh, the name is ICIC uh, 2011 in Jayapura. What sur surprising me at the time was in Jayapura they have like uh, 54 hotels, and they have also four st four star hotel like uh, Aston, Swiss Bell, Fox uh, Hotel, and so on. So our conference at the time uh, we managed to attract like 312 papers. And then 15 uh, uh, countries was also uh, attend to that conference, which is came from like Australia, France, Germany, Greece, India, Indonesia, of course, Japan, Malaysia, Morocco, Oman, uh, Nigeria, Netherlands, uh, Philippines, uh, Saudi Arabia, and Sweden. So you can see like uh, Papua is already, already the open uh, space, open city, yeah, especially like Jayapura. So if you have some uh, other conference, I believe you can running it also up there. All right. In relation to the digital infrastructure, um, 
In Indonesia, this is not easy stuff, of course. We have 17,504 uh, islands, according to the government data. The, as you know, if we talking about the number of the island always changing, depend on the situation in the in the, the sea, basically, right? And then, what's the problem here? The problem is when we want to transfer an, uh, a, a, a data, for example, from one island to the other island, especially when we have the distance more than 180 uh, kilometers, that's really hard. Because if you put like two, uh, two like a microwave, for example, you know the, the the surface of the sea is not flat, so you so you, we cannot just transfer the data just like that. Even though actually, when we have in Indonesia we have Palapa rings, we have like the east and the middle and also in the uh, west part. It's already done. Actually, 100% done and already also inaugurated by our president back to uh, I think on the 15 October. Uh, uh, to, uh, 2019 last year, but the problem here is, of course, yeah, in terms of the functionality, we need to increase them, increase it, um, and also the the usability of the, uh, the the channel also for the communication. So I think uh, the moderator will give me one or two minutes. I don't want to <laughs> more. I think yeah, yeah. I'll delay also. So, okay, so with that, that uh, we hope that uh, our webinar today, the collaboration between the Air Bay Channel and Mandala Wangi, uh, can uh, give us more objective perspective and also to raise the new idea for the uh, future development of Papua. And like uh, Freddy mentioned earlier, we're also inviting uh, uh, international community to helping Papua to more uh, advance, of course. Of course, uh, they have to come to the, 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 the right channel, the government channel. So again, with that, thank you, everyone. Hope you enjoyed the webinar today. Thank you. Yes. Back to my IP uh, Yeah, uh, I would like to say sorry first uh, for the uh, the tr little trouble this morning when we are start. But uh, uh, I'm really happy yeah, that uh, our discussions today uh, is really uh very serious topic, even uh, about geopolitics and um, geostrategies. But we are proved today that uh, uh, Papua is not a problem to talk. But maybe uh, uh, so far, the way we talk is a problem for that. So uh, I only want uh, a little add, yeah, uh, based on my experience for 17 years uh, uh, go around Papua uh, to drive uh, ecotourism. Uh, ecotourism uh, there uh, as a destinations, um, which uh, I saw that's a, a very progressive uh, development, uh, especially for the access who who now uh, to reach Papua is more cheaper and uh, uh, Indonesians now. Before eighty percent is my client is only orang bule, yeah? uh, only the foreigners uh, who can reach. Uh, every corner of Indonesia, but now uh, everyone, every Indonesian can reach every corner of uh, their country. And so I really approve that our Bahasa Indonesia is really pemersatu, uh, yeah, who, who can, uh, it's very powerful language to uh, unite us as a nation. And, so, and there are also, so, uh, at the moment now, mm -hmm. I uh, based on Pak uh, Freddy supervisors, uh, uh, we are try to develop things, uh, uh, war tourism uh, destinations in Papua, uh, which uh, I just uh, read, uh, I just launched uh, uh, the book about Biak Islands, which uh, we just know, uh, we learned that the Pacific War, which happened in Biak Island is very important. So, starting points uh, for the Americans uh, to end World War, yeah? Uh, maybe Pa Richard, so, so maybe after this, maybe I, I will consultation for you, with you, Pa. <laughs> yeah, but uh, anyway, uh, again, uh, thank you very much for these discussions. Well, we will uh, try to, to talk about more Papua, yeah? Uh, we believe now, uh, I think everyone agree with me, uh, that's ethnographical and uh, anthropolog uh, anthropo uh, sorry anthropological approach is more uh, needed for uh, Papua. And again, Papua is not the problem, but maybe the way 
is a problem. Yeah, the way we talk is a problem. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Richard, Pak Richard, and Ambassador Predinumberi, and uh, another speakers, and Smandalawangi group, uh, and then our moderator, <laughs> and everyone. Uh, see you again for our next discussions about Papua. Bye, Pak bye. Richard, aku boleh minta kontaknya nanti ya. <laughs> okay, bisa. Sangat rahasia Mbak Evi untuk Pak Richard. Iya. Mbak Sri, terima kasih.